Okay. I've been given the go ahead. So we're gonna start on with our workshop today. So welcome everyone. Um, can everybody see the slide presentation? I'm getting thumbs up. Wonderful. Um, so as I think everyone is aware, we're going to be working through a collaborative workshop today, going over a series of um, background uh, discussion points that were brought together through um, the previous consultation that the uh, STLT next sorry, STLC Next uh, project has undertaken to get them to this point in their ideation phase. So um, without uh, further ado, I wanted to reflect on um, our, the lands on which we are situated. Oops, <laughs> there we go. Um, and before I jump into our, our land acknowledgement, I wanted to note this morning when I was walking uh, down by the water, in Takaranto here, um, uh, there was a beautiful rainbow over the city. And I thought, wow, how auspicious. Here we are coming together um, to discuss this amazing new project. And we were blessed by this beauty from the sky. So I hope that gives us a little more inspiration as we come together and share ideas to help to create some, some um, parameters for the STLC Next project. So on the land acknowledgement, I do want to recognize and, and uh, heartfeltly acknowledge that we are on the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit, um, the Wendat people, the, um, the Haudenosaunee, and of course the uh, Mississaugas of the Credit, which came to the trees later. It's a traditional land of all Haudenosaunee speaking people. Um, it's also the area that is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Covenant and the, uh, the two row belt covenant, which are essentially agreements that um, share the responsibility of caring for this land around the Great Lakes region. Um, and so I think it's a, it's a poignant reminder that that is one of the under her foundational objectives for us to keep in mind is that we want to advance our practices so that we can help the climate and help the earth around us to, um, to be safe uh, through the, all the disruption of climate change. Okay. so. I'm moving on to the next slide now. And I wanted to, this is going to be a quick overview. I'm not going to go through details here, but what I wanted to point out is that we will be doing introductions of the TO Live team, followed by introductions of the workshop collaborator. Um, and then we are going to uh, frame the discussion. And at that time, I'm going to invite Leslie Lester to give us a little bit of an inspiration and background on the, the goals for today. And then I'll go in, into more details on what um, the process will be and, and how it's going to play out. So without getting into too many details, I'm going to introduce myself first a little bit more fulsomely. And I'm going to borrow a page from some things that I learned yesterday, because I believe firmly in continuous improvement. And so what I was really impressed by yesterday, Jade, was that um, we, you know, there is a benefit to introducing ourselves in the way we look for those who might have difficulties in visualizing us, uh, be it through limitations of the internet or otherwise. So I wanted to start by introducing myself as a, a Caucasian descent, middle-aged woman with gray hair. I'm wearing a blue uh, no sleeve shirt on camera here. It's a dress. <laughs> and um, that is my introduction. And I also say that I come uh, my background is in environmental program design, development, and continuous improvement. And I have had the pleasure of facilitating many workshops. And I really am excited to be on this journey with you all today. Um, and with that said, I'm going to turn it over to the TO Live team for introduction. Good morning, everybody. My name is Leslie Lester. I'm representing my TO Live colleagues today. I am the Vice President of the Redevelopment of the St. Lawrence Center. This is indeed my baby. I have been working on this project uh, for quite some time. Even before I came to TO Live, I've been reimagining the St. Lawrence Center. I've been working in the performing arts industry in Toronto for almost four decades now. I was the uh, chief liaison uh, in the building of the um, Young Center for the Performing Arts, which is in the distillery district. 
and I had uh, that was sort of my warm up to this particular project, and that uh, opened in 2006. This is really exciting. I wanted to just take one moment to thank Bettina and Mike and all my new friends at Sustainability uh, Buildings Canada. It has been glorious working with you on this project. It's such an honor. Um, thanking all the SMEs, because I've now uh, known this new acronym, and particularly the students. I really want to thank you for being here. This building is actually for you. This is all about the next generation and the generations to come. This is about the future, and we really, really appreciate you thinking about this on all of our behalf. So in terms of the people in the neighborhood, the performing arts sector, the city of Toronto and Canada, I think we are gonna do something very transformative for the industry, for the city. And this workshop is, is actually on the precipice of being part of, uh, as you probably know, the RFP for the International Design Competition, which I'm really, really excited about, as are all my friends at CreateTO and everyone where we are partnering with on this project. So this is a really, really important step. Um, I'm going to be here all day. I hope I can answer any questions anyone has. And if I don't, I am going to um, get information for you as soon as possible for my colleagues who are very busy uh, in their corners of the office doing the things that they need to do today that, and can't join you here in person. So thank you again, and I look forward to the day. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Leslie, for that great introduction and some background about the the journey of the project to get to now to this point point now. And really looking forward to the session. So moving on, I'm taking it then we're not uh, Matt is, and Clyde are not able to join us at this point. Correct. Okay. Sorry. I'm just waiting for my slide to advance. There we go. Okay, so um, to walk us through our introductions, I thought we would, the, the photographs on this slide are organized by alphabet according to the first initial of the first name. So I thought we could use that same process to introduce ourselves to the full audience. Many of you have been on camera already, um, so it might be an opportunity for you to introduce yourself a little bit differently today. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to Bettina to start us off. And I will unmute. Thanks, Leslie, both Leslies. Uh, th this year I've had three important Leslies in my life and it's made my life much richer. Uh, so you guys know me as the person that has been with you for boot camp, but in my other life, I uh, run a company called Sage Living. I specialize in uh, advising, consulting for builders, uh, architects and clients, helping them to make buildings better. My specific area of expertise is health and well-being in the built environment. Thank you so much, Bettina. Uh, moving on to Kara. Oh, hi. I am also a middle-aged white lady um, wearing a short-sleeved uh, top, but I'm also a mechanical engineer um, who's been working in sustainable buildings for about uh, 20 years. So my, one of my passions is trying to figure out how um, well we can actually design buildings to truly integrate with uh, the environment and provide us with positive uh, interior spaces. Thank you, Kara. I appreciate that. Um, moving on to Christine. So I know Christine just wrote in the chat that she was having difficulties with her audio. We'll pass to the next person and then hopefully she'll be back on soon. Thank you so much. So Dave Peterson. Good morning, everyone. Dave Peterson, principal of uh, Outside and Design Build. And I've been focused on um, sustainable developments on the passive side of the equation uh, with a specialty in fenestration for about 30 years now. Um, so much looking forward to this workshop today. There's been some excellent interactions so far with the um, with the students, which I appreciate. Um, this is a neat project, and I think that uh, we've got the right team here to uh, to make it even better. Fantastic. I think you're right, Dave. Uh, moving on to Haley Ray. 
Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my first name is Haley Ray, and my pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm an accessibility specialist working with Human Space, a consultancy of BDP Quadrangle. Um, I'm sitting here today in my home office wearing a white t-shirt, um, braided hair, and I'm a uh, biracial mixed black and white woman, and very excited to be here today. Thank you so much, Haley Ray. Lovely to have you. And then we have Mr. Michael Singleton. You're looking a little different than your photo here, Mike. Yes, there's a, there's a few years in between uh, that photo and <clears throat> what you're seeing now in the uh, perhaps the top left of your screen. Uh, that photo was taken uh, back when Bruce Springsteen played an electric guitar, not an acoustic one. And uh, I was quite a Bruce Springsteen fan at that time. Um, and that photo was taken on Big Wind Island at the Lake of Bays. Um, so yeah, I'm beyond middle age and uh, I wear a hat because that hair is long gone. Um, but uh, uh, we had some fun picking a photo for me yesterday that Leslie was intent on posting. So thank you. Um, need to thank, first of all, the team who's uh, pulled this together, um, uh, Bettina, um, Adam Jones, and I have thanked these folks before, but Bettina, uh, Adam Jones, uh, Jay Lico, uh, Jen McKinnon, who I don't think is uh, online uh, at the moment, uh, done an awesome job. I want to thank Leslie and her team um, for allowing us to work on this project. As Dave said, it's a really cool project. It's very exciting and really represents a, a, an opportunity to totally change the dynamic of the St. Lawrence uh, market area. So uh, I'm very excited about that. I um, uh, want to thank um, Leslie Kulperger for facilitating for us today and our subject matter expert team. Uh, this is an awesome group. I've worked with uh, all of them uh, over the years. We have done uh, over 600 integrated design workshops on every kind of, uh, every, uh, kind of building that you can imagine uh, across the country. And so we have a great team and I think we're really going to hear some some wonderful things and get some great ideas. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from the students. Um, as Leslie Lester uh, indicated, mm -hmm. this building is really your building uh, because you will be uh, around you know, uh, many years from now when this building is being used. So thank you all for attending. I'm looking forward to the day. Thanks so much, Mike. I appreciate all of that, uh, the insights into the team working on everything and the wealth of knowledge that the, the subject matter experts bring to this process is incredible. Uh, I think it's going to be a very um, uh, a learning opportunity, a great day. Um, moving forward to Nicole Parsons, if she's here. I am here. Uh, my name is Nicole. I am also a a white woman who is not quite ready to admit that she's probably middle-aged, uh, brown hair, wearing a black and pink shirt. And my expertise, uh, similar to Dave, is in the passive uh, enclosure realm. And uh, in these workshops, I usually focus on the opaque enclosure. In my uh, other work outside of these workshops, I work with both the opaque enclosure and uh, fenestrations and roofing and all of that good stuff uh, as a, a project director and technical lead with WSP Canada. Wonderful. Welcome, Nicole. And uh, last but certainly not least, Sebastian. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sebastian Carrizo. Call me Seba. Uh, that's how I usually go by. Um, I've been uh, doing building performance simulations for the last nine years, so not not as experienced as some of my colleagues here, but i um, always found a passion in, in the puzzle that is buildings and, and energy modeling as, as a way of connecting all those elements. Um, I mentioned this on Tuesday. I'm originally from Argentina. I've been in Canada for 10 years. I'm the proud father of, of, of two crazy, hectic boys, Lucas and Mateo, and I'm really, really excited to, to be here. Thank you so much. Saba, Saba, I haven't called you that before, so that'll be first for me. I'm going to try to remember to do that throughout the day. Um, before we move forward into the workshop, I wanted to just invite if, uh, if there are any other um, members of the Toronto team, whether it's Transform TO or others that want to introduce themselves, um, I, I want to give a moment to allow for that. 
Victor, can you hear me? We can hear you. Excellent. So Devin stops here. I'm on the phone. I wasn't able to get connected uh, to GoTo meeting this morning yet. Um, I'm a senior engineer with our uh, with the City of Toronto's Public Energy Initiatives team. Uh, so I'm um, happy to talk about um, some of our um, net zero strategy for existing buildings and how this uh, might integrate today. So, thanks. Wonderful. Thanks, Devin, for being here. Is and, there any? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Thanks, uh, David McMillan. Also, Devin's colleague from the City uh, Environment and Energy Division. I'm a program manager there, working on uh, new development and uh, and renewable energy. Thanks for having me. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Okay. Um, I think we have everyone. Has, although we have not had an opportunity to have Christine Abbey be introduced yet. Um, I think we're going to allow her to introduce when she arrives. Um, I think she's having difficulties getting on, is my understanding. So we won't delay uh, working through or working into the workshop then. Um, so moving forward. Oh, as I learned, yeah, okay. So um, I know Leslie Lester gave some background on the um, project, and I don't know, Leslie, if you had more to say. But I wanted to include these three points to frame the discussion as drawing from some of the presentations that we have already seen to date. Um, and, you know, it's that really going beyond the current processes and looking in that transformation. And, you know, how does that transformation really wrap around the, the thoughts around performance and engagement? Um, I think it was Mr. Mag's presentation yes, or was it yesterday or the day before um, that really opened up the door of this uh, philosophy of like, you know, uh, can we have the pigs clearing the land? Now, I don't know if that's practical in this particular set situation, but it's really that, that, you know, taking us out of our normal comfort zone to bring us to a place where that next level of, or I think you're calling it mode three of transformation beyond, you know, the status quo, beyond what we currently know, what, what is imaginable to us. So just wanted to start framing that discussion with that, that sort of mindset. And then, oh, there might be some title shifts in the, in the presentation. And those title shifts might have to do with a game. I'm not so sure. But if you keep your eye on the titles, there might be a few of those through the presentation. And you know what, if you miss them, I don't know what to say. It's going to be sad, I suppose. Um, so moving on from picture this, uh, we're going to take a look at the overarching guiding principles and visions for the um, work, the, the project to date. These are um, things that have come out of the stakeholder consultation process and the research and the, the, the background papers that have been put together to support the project vision at this point. So we're looking at the cultural ecosystem vision that is ensuring a dynamic and highly flexible space. And it has sort of a practical uh, component to it, which is ensuring that it's a multi-use facility. It's, it's optimized from functionality. It has specifically designed for performance and it, it, it you know, meets the, the needs that are currently lacking in the arts ecosystem for the Toronto community and the communities around it. Um, then we're also looking at how do we make this space really inclusive and, and uh, a gathering place, place where people are welcomed and wanting to gather. Um, so building for that extreme usability and what, what, what does that look like and feel like. And I think despite the fact that we all come from our areas of subject matter expertise, the reality is these ideas are going to come from everyone um, to combine and, and, and hopefully co-create a, a very interesting vision for this. Um, in terms of the RFP content. Um, we are going to remember to uh, the community connection vision is that we're really wanting to create a bold and open building that sits within the neighborhood and that making that everyone within the community feel welcome, feel proud of this space in their neighborhood. And then how do we, you know, look at the long-term environmental sustainability vision. So that is, you know, when we see the shifting climates and we know that we're moving towards a heavier cooling load, what is, how do we design this building so that uh, the increased weather incidents and the, the changing um, climate are going to be able to, to be met by this building in 
20 years, 30 years down the road, 50 years down the road. Um, okay, so then the, the, this is really that sort of interactive Venn vision of these pieces coming together. So we have that creative spaces, innovative spaces, gathering spaces, and really, I think when I spoke with Leslie, uh, she made this brilliant point of, this is not only the footprint of the building that we're considering, we're really considering this corridor, this area around the building. And so that is that community um, feel inside, outside, um, uh, not to borrow from Dave Peterson. Uh, <laughs> oh, we've got some feedback. I think, is that Mr. Stokes, did you have something to say? No, oh, okay. Um, so, this I just wanted to show this because this is sort of how the all these different pieces that we're going to be talking about this is how they kind of connect together in the in the broader scheme of the project interface. So we're going to go through all of these little bubbles, if you want to call them that, uh, as discussion points through today. And the way we're going to do this is really um, we're, the purpose of this um, slide is to show us in the bottom left of each slide you're going to have this dial. And the dial will show you where we are in the progression of our discussion. So it's one through seven areas that we're going to talk about. Um, the six that were identified on the preceding slide. And then I've add, we've added in one at the very end, which is around how do we help, um, you know, really uh, gather some insights into the value proposition of this uh, net positive SCLC next corridor. Um, so, oh, I think Christine Abbey may have arrived. Christine, if you are able to um, take yourself on camera and off mute, perhaps we could take a moment and have you introduce yourself at this point, not to make you feel too uncomfortable. Hi, Christine, I think you might be on mute. Uh, Christine's got no uh, audio at all. Continue and, and I will uh, continue to listen. Sorry about that. We can hear you now. We can hear you now. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. There's things I don't have. I'm, I'm on three devices here. I apologize. So um, I'm having trouble getting my camera and everything up, things up on the other one. So I do apologize for the technical difficulty this morning. Um, Christine Abe, I'm a landscape architect and partner at the MBTW Group. Here in Toronto, and uh, we spe my, my specialty within the firm um, specializes in buildings within the urban environment, um, specifically within the GTA, and landscapes associated with them. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I've been working um, with uh, sustainable practices um, for several years now. I can't even count. And um, as a landscape architect, we were kind of on the beginning wave of a lot of the sustainable practices. And um, I am also a board member of Stand Up for Building Canada. So I'll let you go back to your first step to um, your uh, presentation, and I'll hopefully I'll get this set, set straight out. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. And you know, in this world of virtual meetings, if we don't have at least one technical glitch, I think like it, it would be un, it would be unheard of so we all have to face the challenges of technology so don't uh, don't worry about that at all welcome glad you're able to to see us and hear us and uh, hopefully you'll you'll resolve those uh, glitches as we go okay so um i also wanted to call out uh, i know i mentioned already about the gamification codes are going to show up we've already had one so keep an eye out for those and there will be time permitting some audience interaction so we're going to um, open things up in a link for everyone, including the collaborators, which is what I'm calling the TO Live team and, and uh, the Transform TO, any of the Toronto team members who are available to be on this call today, along with the subject matter experts. We're calling you collaborators for the purpose of this uh, presentation. And you, um, the audience or the students, um, I might call audience or students. So we'll we'll make sure that everybody has links to to a word cloud opportunity uh, as we go through, and um, it could be a fun uh, fun way to hear back from the the broader group around what are the ideas that are resonating, what are the things that we brought forward that that are uh, you know really what we want to make sure are highlighted um, in 
the end result of this workshop, which is going to be a report that, that will be based on the recommendations, the thoughts, the ideas that come out of this workshop. So this will be documented into a report format so that the, uh, the, the TO Live team can, can borrow from it, use what they will from it to help to create an RFP that is um, going to support their international design competition on this project. Okay, so moving on. I just want to acknowledge Steve Hahn as well, who I'm seeing is here from the City of Toronto, so welcome. If you want to introduce yourself, feel free, otherwise some people do come just to observe and listen and we totally respect that as well. Yeah, sure. Uh, sorry, I, I tried to introduce myself <clears throat> when Devin and David uh, introduced themselves and my mic wasn't working. <laughs> um, can you guys hear me now? Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm Stephen Ahn, I'm an energy consultant. Uh, I'm also with the City of Toronto uh, Public Initiatives uh, Existing Buildings Unit. Um, I'm mainly supporting a couple of programs that we have here uh, to promote uh, net zero uh, for existing buildings. Wonderful, welcome Stephen. I'm sorry that I didn't realize you were um, trying to introduce yourself sooner. Thank you Bettina for catching that, welcome. I can also okay. jump into it. Sarah Rodriguez here from the city as well. And, and okay. I might be a little bit more of a fly on the wall. So sorry, I don't have my camera on. Uh, but I am new to the existing buildings unit, but not new to the environment and climate division at the city of Toronto. Uh, and I am working with the existing buildings unit um, to launch a new grant program, which actually will be launched tomorrow called the Deep Retrofit Challenge. And I'm um, very excited for this workshop and to participate and um, very nice to meet all of you. Very cool. Thanks so much, Sarah. I appreciate you uh, introducing yourself and, and giving us a bit of a prelude to the, the Deep Retrofit Challenge program coming soon. Um, okay, thanks. Uh, do we have, is there anyone else that wanted to take a moment to introduce themselves uh, that's involved in the collaboration here? I'm listening to the Jeopardy music in my head. I think the time has passed. We're good. Okay, so we're moving into our first discussion point. And um, this is really about the sky is not the limit. There's, this is limitless possibilities. Um, this is blue sky in a most authentic way. When we think about um, your respective subject areas of expertise. You know, what comes to mind when you think of this idea of creative development for performance work studios? When we think about creative development in a performance work studio, I think we need to consider the performance space. So we wanna think about um, rehearsal spaces. We wanna think about design studios. We wanna think about um, a rehearsal halls potentially. Um, what other, you know, is there recording studios? Are there, Art studio. So what are these spaces going to look and feel like? That's difficult to know, but when you're thinking about performance, I think you have to try to imagine if we're bringing the more community involvement into this space that there's going to potentially be a lot more types of spaces that will be used for the arts community in Toronto. And then how do we make these spaces really um, creative? How do we develop them in a way that's creative from you know, noise, air circulation, all those different things that we have to consider. So the way I think that we're going to process uh, or, or get the input to start with is I'm going to do a popcorn situation. So everybody that is collaborating in the workshop, if you don't mind maybe having your camera on, that will be more helpful for each, uh, for each of us to identify you um, because I don't necessarily, I won't necessarily always be the person choosing who goes next because we can do a popcorn where I might choose somebody, then they might choose the next person. For the first one, to get us going, I am going to um, pick on the, the people who will be collaborating, and then we can go that way to begin with. And then hopefully, as we get more comfortable with the process, we'll be um, just chiming in when we want to add our opinions and our thoughts about things. So Mike, because you just came off uh, on camera again, I think this would be a great opportunity for me to pick on you. As a stick on you, I say that jokingly, I mean, welcome you to talk about what do you think, you know, a creative development idea for a performance work studio might be from your perspective? 
Uh, yeah, thanks, Leslie. So I guess, you know, my perspective and my background uh, is in, you know, sustainability and uh, uh, energy use and energy efficiency and renewable energy and so on. So um, my comments kind of re reflect um, that background. Um, you know, we we have done a lot of these workshops I indicated earlier. Um, there's always a kind of a marriage uh, and, and it might even be a bit of uh, opposition between uh, what I characterize as, as uh, high tech solutions for energy performance or sustainability versus passive ones. And um, there are lots of examples of high tech solutions um, that haven't worked out. Um, and, you know, the more technology you build into a building, uh, the more likely, the, the more difficult it becomes to, to operate the building. Uh, and, uh, you know, the sort of intended possible problems down the line. And I'm sure we all can think of examples of, of technologies that have failed. And uh, there is a kind of a, uh, a rate of technical failure that occurs for all technologies. So, you know, I'd be interested to think about how we can employ more passive solutions in this building, simpler solutions, if you will. Um, but I'm careful about using that, that term because um, that's not necessarily uh, what's implied. Um, but you know this this kind of understanding of let, let's accomplish as much as we can without burdening operators uh, in the future with highly technical um, uh, challenges in terms of um, maintenance and operations of equipment. Uh, I really think in terms of a spe some specific technologies, um, uh, ground source heat pumps, uh, geothermal is really the way to go uh for, for this building um you know i'll defer to our mechanical experts uh for the specifics but uh i i think you know in terms of achieving the transform to um targets with um you know zero carbon or even positive carbon we really need to consider uh, geothermal as our you know predominant heating and cooling uh, system and, and form but but beyond that i think it really um, systems that can um, uh, first and foremost understand and uh, embrace passive solutions, I think uh, would be wonderful. Um, and uh, I'll be interested to hear from our subject matter experts if there's any of those things that kind of um, resonate with them. Um, is that helpful, Leslie? That that is wonderfully helpful, Mike. And I especially like the idea of the more passive and simple as we open this discussion because it harkens back to the point around you know having the pigs clear the field. Field. It's not that the uh, solution wasn't innovative, but it was using a very obvious opportunity. Um, so sometimes what is passive, what is simple, what is obvious is very innovative too. Um, now, if I could maybe turn to uh, Haley Ray uh, for a next thought on um, this creative space idea because I think you're going to bring a different perspective and I'd love to we, I think we'd all love to hear that. Sure thanks so much Leslie. Um, when I read this question I think some of the first uh, design elements that came to mind just in recognizing um, that performance uh, spaces may include spaces for rehearsal, design studios, um, recording studios, etc. Um, I thought about um, furniture, fixtures, and equipment um, as being elements that um, are commonly considered for in better practices for accessibility, but not so much in the realm of um, minimum requirements. Um, and so there needs to be consideration for how that FFNE um, provides uh, access and inclusion to folks who are, who are engaging with it. In addition to that, um, the ways in which we approach lighting and acoustics and any sort of materials and finishes throughout each of these individual spaces, recognizing that there are um, uh, a list of criteria um, that are essential for the performance space to do what we need it to do. Um, uh, and, and the idea that um, the folks using these spaces are far beyond um, the idea of a normative user. Um, let's demystify a normative user. It doesn't exist. We this are is Adam. Oh, 
we are all very complex and particularly persons with disabilities as a user are incredibly complex. So um, the idea that uh, those individuals as a community um, should be considered on all sides of that creative development process. They may be a part of the sort of um, in front of the camera uh, sort of aspect of those performance spaces and the development of that, um, or they might be behind the camera. So just consideration for um, the accessibility and inclusion of their participation in all areas. Wow, that's incredible. And thank you so much uh, for bringing that uh, wonderful perspective for uh, consideration. Oh, sorry, Leslie. Um, I just wanted to add, thank you for that. We, When we went through the public consultation, we talked a lot about accessibility, which has many, many interpretations. One of the things, it's a small detail, but I think might open uh, people's minds a little bit that we talked about a lot is that this building, because we want to open it 24 seven to the public, they have to be able to go everywhere. Right now, there's very limited spaces that anyone who has any mobility issues can go to. And mobility is a very specific thing, but I'll just use that as a good example. We talked a lot about all of the spaces, including, and very specifically, the technical spaces to, to be very accessible um, for people with mobility issues. Uh, you don't normally see that for people that are operators and also that they could be teaching spaces. So that means that anything that is enclosed like a recording studio or a sound booth, those have to be very, very accessible as well. So thinking about the whole building, I think will be incorporated into a design, maybe to your point that the new normative is actually absolutely accessible so you're not really thinking about what is and what isn't that it actually it feels incredibly open and accessible and that's including every single space in the entire building whether it's going down three floors or up so thank you for that if i could just add as well yesterday we had an accessibility panel and they it was so interesting to hear to a to a woman instead of to a man uh, they all mentioned how much more accessible art became to them, performance uh, was to them because of COVID, because of all the, the access virtually and being able to experience uh, performances in the comfort of their own space. Many of them talked about the discomfort of not being able to access now. And as, as accessible as we make a new space, the they also still want to continue. They made it very clear that having virtual access as an ongoing feature was, was extremely important to them. Sorry, I just remembered one other thing which I thought was so heartfelt. And it's, it, it's true that even when you do experience things virtually, the thing that you miss is the, the, the companionship of having people around you. And, and it, I think it, there are creative ways that we can consider including people in both the virtual world and the real world. I know one feeling that I always have coming out of a theater is I'm so lifted and I'm so excited. And I'm so happy and I want to share it. I want to continue. I, I remember coming out of the ballet with my kids and my husband and I dancing into the, into the subway and our kids sort of <laughs> completely embarrassed. And, and, you know, David has asked us to reimagine what can we do not only to experience that that moment, but even enjoy it more together in community afterward in creative and different ways? Thank you so much for chiming in, Bettina. I love the um, the you know amplifying the voices that you heard yesterday, and then also sharing that that desire to continue the feeling afterwards. And I I think we um, would I'd love to revisit that of when we get to uh, discussion a little bit later around that blurring the lines between inside and outside because I think that's a very uh, good good uh, point to be made in, in that part of the discussion as well. And before um, we move on from you, I wonder is there is there anything else that you wanted to add in terms of these creative spaces? What what is your blue sky idea? Is, is it is is there something else that you wanted to add? I had one other thought and. 
it's complicated, but I, I'm not a big sports fan. And I went with a friend to an open. And in that open, you could go into the to the practice tennis courts and you could just watch. Anybody could walk in and, and experience a bit of tennis. I, I didn't want to actually go and watch the whole game, but I wanted to experience a little bit of it. And I wanted to have that feeling of, of, of like I, I belonged because a lot of people were very dressed up and very fancy and I did I don't understand tennis so I didn't feel like I belonged but being able to to go into that space and just see they, they're just people like me and the people who are watching are also people just like me some not some you know where or individual I loved Haley's comment yesterday about the difference between universal design being designing all spaces accessible for all people and the other part about uh, we're all individuals. You're, you're going to say it much better, Haley. But this idea that, uh, so, so from my perspective, comfort and belonging, so health, well being, how can we create a space where people are inspired to enjoy and feel like they belong and feel like they can take part in observing, being a part of, understanding what that creative space is and how. Each of us belongs to that people in the community, how they belong, how they are welcome. These are, when I think of creative spaces, I think how can everyone feel that they belong and that they're comfortable? Yeah, that really resonated with me as well, Bettina, this idea of kind of inviting the community to be part of art and witness it and kind of engage. I mean, I mean from a technical perspective, I'm not really sure how that happens, but in my mind, there's almost like a either like a window or a view into the performance space so that as a neighborhood you're invited and, and art almost like extends beyond the building when i think of a theater or a performing arts center i think of a box where all the kind of all the art is kind of contained and kind of capsule and i think this idea of kind of opening it up to the neighborhood and and, and the rest of the, the bystanders that maybe just want to as you said just get a little bit of, of a glimpse into it i think I think that's what in my mind comes to to this um, things like adaptive spaces, not only accessible to people and different um, and different abilities, but also accessible to different forms of art. We see experimental um, media, experimental art as being something that keeps pushing on that. I think keeping spaces that are able to accommodate different. Um, types of, of, of our mediums, uh, I think would be really important. In my kind of blue sky, I see a space that can change shapes and forms and can adapt to the number of people that are within it, the, the space itself, the function, but in a way that, that also ties in mechanical systems. So they're actually doing it in an efficient way. Oftentimes, I, I look at a, at a performance center and say, oh, well, half of it is empty or there's an on and off button, and that's really the two modes that there are. And I think, I think that in my mind, that idea of kind of spaces that can be reimagined to, to fit the needs of, of the occupants is, is kind of what that creative development looks like for. Thank you very much for chiming in, Sava. That was uh, I, I love that adaptive and and a great um, great for sharing your what resonates with you in a blue sky scenario. And it makes me think, Kara, how do we do this from a practical mechanical sense or from a, a future mechanical sense? Perhaps we could get your thoughts uh, on your blue sky, not necessarily responding to the visions that you've heard so far, but uh, perhaps keeping those in mind. Yeah, I think uh, the number one thing that occurs to me as a mechanical engineer is that um, when we're thinking about performance spaces, they're often internally focused so they're not going to have a ton of light coming in from the outside or influence from the outside so when we're talking about passive systems on the other hand those are directly linked to the uh, often the acoustic experience um, and the light that's coming in from outside so i have these two thoughts um, the one is when you're not linked to the outside people are the people and performance actually are the two variables. So lights and the heat gain that they make and people and the ventilation that they need. So as we plan these spaces, how do we make them flexible so that the 
audience can be placed wherever we want them. The performers can be placed wherever we want them. When we say the capacity of a room, is there a way to have different kinds of spaces that have different um, airflow arrangements? Um, so Mike said he wanted geothermal. And for me, geothermal, you know, it goes all the way under the very bottom of the building and it's a great way to get energy into the building. But I'm super interested in how do we get air into the space? So if we have a raised floor system, for example, with panels that we can move around so that you can put the audience anywhere and then direct the air anywhere in certain spaces, I think that would be really important. Um, we know that some kinds of performance generate, say, smoke for smoke machines, that that's an element of um, traditions uh, for First Nations people as well. So how do we make sure that we can have tobacco in some of these rooms um, as part of ceremony? Like all of those things. And from a mechanical perspective, I think it's going to be really important to just have um, a lot of air potentially available, but have the ability to dial it up and down. Um, and, and lastly, all of that flexibility will be very expensive. So it doesn't need to be every room. It needs to be a few rooms, and then we need to be able to really carefully dial in which of those spaces have access. Um, finally, I, you know, being able to strategically access the outside is a really cool idea. So could some of these spaces have skylights that have um, electrochromic glass that can be blacked out or opened up so that you could strategically light a daytime performance with daylight when you need it and black it out when you didn't need it. Okay, that's what I got. You you stole so, what I was going to say, so, Karen. Uh, <laughs> there's so much to add. So I was waiting to type there. in about yeah, skylights. I just, they, um, I was thinking about like the performance spaces and the spaces that are used for performances with an audience and how they're so dark and closed off like Kara was saying and how those performers when they're um, rehearsing are potentially in that space you know all day every day for weeks on end and so to have um, some means of bringing light inside whether that's a skylight whether you have to look at uh, other mechanisms, if you don't have a direct roof on top of you, you know, there are ways to move the light and bring it in um, so that you can have that natural light available to these people who are going to be uh, rehearsing and practicing in these spaces, but then also the ability to, um, to close that off during performances so that you have, can, you then have the control over the lighting that you need uh, to be able to put together the the performance experience as it's been designed so and i think david was waiting to say something too he's had his hand up on his screen so before i hand it back oh. maybe i'll give him a chance to jump in thanks nicole i well, i i can't figure out how to raise my hand on go to but anyways um I, i'll just say uh i think materials are really going to matter uh for a couple of reasons obviously you know my 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 expertise well expertise uh, something my interest is on on carbon and there are material choices that really matter there uh, but also i think what's more relevant to performance spaces is uh your materials can uh, mean something and like you know wood is both great on carbon but it's it is one of those things there's a reason creative industries seek out those old brick and beam buildings right uh wood is you know, is is fa is fantastic material. It looks cool. It smells great. You know, it's you know, indoor air quality is going to matter here too. If you for performance spaces, you want healthy indoor air. So I think uh, wood is not the only. Uh, there's obviously many other things, but uh, natural materials. Uh, I think uh, it's early in the design, but that will be important um, later on. Those are excellent points, David. Sorry, I didn't realize you were putting your hand up. Uh, I appreciate you. Uh, feel free to chime in at any point. This is a dinner table discussion, if you will. Nicole, yeah. thank you for making sure that we um, were able to hear David's perspective and also for jumping in and sharing your own. Um, and now keeping with the Dave, perhaps we can think about windows again. And, and Dave Peterson, do you have something to add in your blue sky um, in, in addition to what you've heard so far or, or a different perspective? 
Well, so Kara and Nicole both had some scope creep there in terms of the fenestration discussion, which is fine because we should be all, you know, interacting with this. And, and those points that they both made, I fully agree with. I think the one thing that I would add to this, and I love the idea of, of being able to sort of work with, you know, human scale vision glazing, diffuse glazing, if that's a skylight or a monitor, um, operable glazing, again, from a passive ventilation perspective can help us bring fresh air or even open up, you know, a, a performance to the night sky, um, you know, sort of a, a mini sky dome. Um, there's some really cool concepts there. Um, they all definitely connect to first cost maintenance as well downstream. Um, but these create some really interesting components and combinations that we could certainly look at. Thermal comfort is the other challenge. If, if we're doing sort of that type of natural daylight harvesting, especially through fenestration, then we have to think, think about the thermal as, uh, aspects as well within that space. I know that some of the challenges that came up with the existing Meridian Hall through discussions with Matt and the workshop we did with his team, you know, created some challenges in terms of how that space is, is connected with, let's say, logistics. Um, you know, we had the main stage connected to a series of roll-up doors that were, you know, somewhat inefficient. Um, and the challenge, of course, is that with performers practicing on that stage um, with a, you know, a, a door in January that, that might be open for, for substantial amounts of time, this created some real thermal challenges, um, certainly for the people watching this, but certainly for the, you know, for the performers as well. And that would impact their performances, I'm thinking. So, you know, thinking about sort of those requirements, not just the visitors, but the actual performers and, and making sure that we have some thermal consistency, um, not too cold in the winter, not too hot in the summer. Um, the other component with the, with the daylighting is, of course, if we bring in too much natural light, we have glare issues and, and that's debilitating as well, not just for people uh, with disabilities, but for anybody in that space to, to try to, you know, work with that high contrast. So there's a lot of things that have to really come together here. Um, you know, and this discussion, I think, is really the starting point to, to sort of evolve some of these ideas into, into practical measures. Yeah, thanks, David. It, it really is the starting point of just kind of getting our ideas flowing, and then we can start to kind of funnel them down and narrow them down. And I um, appreciate you bringing your perspective to the workshop. Um, and uh, finally, Christine, do you have some thoughts that you'd like to add around What's your, you know, blue sky creative development for performance work studio ideas? Thank you. Um, I think as everyone is focused on the interior as a landscape architect, my focus is, is essentially the exterior um, and the outside spaces. So as we look at these performance spaces and we talk about my blue sky, um, a lot of when you think of other performance spaces throughout the city, you, you, like even uh, globally, um, there's not a lot of green space associated with the um, a lot of hard open spaces, not the arrival area, which is understandable as, as, as for the crush space for people um, coming into this into the into the facility. But it'd be interesting in my blue sky is to have more green into these areas, more soft landscape into the areas. And how do we enhance? the green and ecology and biodiversity performance standards that we would look to um, as part of um, a more sustainable development. And how can we create those and integrate those into the spaces of the exterior? What are the opportunities that we're going to be doing of, of that roof? That roof is a is a valuable resource that's going to be used for a number of things. And <clears throat> excuse me, is there a way that we can <clears throat> access that space and create other outdoor spaces that, that and other opportunities in those spaces. Because this is a performance and work studios, is there opportunity for us to, in other spaces on the site to create those outdoor um, living areas that, that people can access, people can work in? One of the things coming out of the pandemic again is that people have really truly valued those little green outdoor spaces, whether they're not they're working at home, whether or not they're working in an office or or I mean, just being able to access a little bit of green space. And, you know, the location of our site is very urban. It is surrounded by concrete, it's surrounded by buildings, but we do have Bursey Park across the street. So is there a way that we can visually connect our buildings to the other green spaces in the city, the other little green gems that we're gonna create within that city? And is there a way that even within um, our building, 
is there a small little space that we can create for people that do want to work outside or at least have access to see the outside? So it goes back to the, the, the conversation of, of, of glazing and other aspects within there. But I think it's really important that people don't lose that connection to the green space, don't lose that connection to that soft, um, those soft elements that, you know, in our urban structured world, it is so often so nice to have that touch point back to a little bit of nature. So that's our challenge. How do we create those spaces? How do we integrate those spaces? How do we in, in incorporate more of those green areas? And when I say green, I don't mean the sustainable green, but, but physically landscape spaces that also contribute to the overall sustainability of the building and the performance area and the structure of it itself. So how do we do that? How do we find that? How do we find those spaces that really could be real gems within the building um, that we have these little, even if it's small, little green, little outdoor, little niches and courtyards and, and maybe um, really Think about how we use that roof. How do, how can we use that roof? Now, are there things that we can do there that make this building really, really special? That's good. So that's yeah, Christine, your blue sky is very green. I love it. I know. <laughs> I know. I'm so green. <laughs> exactly. Like, what do you mean? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I noticed, Leslie, I think you had something to add there. Why don't I turn it over to you? Um, I'm I'm apologizing in advance if I'm repeating anything that's been said during the week because I haven't been present uh, at every plenary. But um, just just to review anyway, in in our discoveries and in the test fit of the program, there was absolutely a desire uh, to link Bursey Park to Scott Street. So basically the street that is in between uh, the St. Lawrence Centre presently and Meridian Hall, and to pedestrianize that and to basically create the same choreography that you see in Bursey Park right now, which is very well utilized for that tiny strip, and bring it across the street and potentially even create a road diet in front of the St. Lawrence Centre so that that whole area becomes an outdoor plaza, if you will. You might think of a better word than that, but this idea that it really is the neighborhood. And when you're when you're looking at Front and Young and you're looking towards St. Lawrence Market, you see a massive footprint uh, of green and people, basically, that are are well, maybe four legged things too, but that are basically using this space. Um, as much as we can carry that on any floor, on any roof of the new proposed building would be great. The condominiums have all been very expressive in terms of what's gonna happen with this building and what are they gonna be looking down on? So the, the vertical integration of anything green is gonna be really critical for all the people that are looking at the building now. And they're looking at some pretty not so pretty <laughs> uh, cement and 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 the HVAC system that's up there right now. So in terms of something that's very welcoming, that is probably going to be public space. Any any anything that we're talking about that is roof is probably going to be utilized because the more public space, the better. Um, particularly outdoors, to be thinking about that. Even if it's exposed ideas, and I was thinking about this anything that we expose i don't know where like how far we go in terms of anything that we're doing that is green literally or green figuratively i think could be very theatrical and very interesting so if we can see through floors if you can see you know uh, things happening that are you know in, in, in terms of the, the science experiment of wastewater or geothermal or something like that, anything that is exposed to me is interesting and theatrical and engaging. And that's where participation in a building, I think, could really happen. So just adding a little bit of color there. I love it. Thank you so much, Leslie. I think the more color we have, the more we are going to be creative and land on some great concepts that can support your RFP process. So um, th the more voices we hear through this process, the better. Uh, so what I, the next um, 
I think we've heard from everybody on this, and if anyone wants to share their, their blue sky, they can feel free to jump in now. But what we're going to do is take our blue sky and we're going to try to funnel it down. We're going to try to start to get a little bit more specific and using a Moscow approach, like what's the must have, what's the should have, could have, and oh, maybe it's a, an important to remember, but it's deferred or it's, we could have it later. So um, if you think about really those top priority things, where like the absolutes, the, the really we should consider this, really we must consider this. Um, and I think there were a lot of great ideas that came through the last um, blue sky uh, discuss, point, part of this discussion, we're still focused on these creative spaces. Remembering that, I mean, I know that we talk about the roof, I think the roof can be a creative space. I think um, integrating something along the front to connect to the, to the garden across the street can be a creative space. And also in, within the, the building itself, while we're talking about a large theater space, we're also talking about workshop areas. We're also talking about perhaps smaller um, performance hall spaces. I mean, it depends on how many stories we have here. I believe there are going to be um, at least four, if not more, stories so that we have opportunities to integrate maybe the, the, the niches for uh, little garden corners or all the different things that we've heard so far. And, you know, maybe glazing in certain parts of the window sphere, but maybe not in others. I'm not sure how that looks and feels. So just sharing back some of the things that I've heard to help to prime you all in this next discussion of when you get it into um, the, really this RFP kind of place, what are we wanting to recommend or what are, that the city consider be um, included or noted in that, in that process? So I am going to, I think maybe start from the mechanics because I think I mean, I guess it could start from a lot of different places, but I think that when we talk about making sure that the air quality or the the um, the that we're meeting or going beyond uh, what's required in a place that's really flexible and different, that might be one of the challenge components. So why don't I turn it to Kara to start this one? Yeah, I'm a huge advocate of exploring both displacement ventilation and leveraging stack effect as part of your design tools when making spaces work. The reason I really like that is that every human is a tiny uh, thermal battery, so air will move up each person and out of the breathing zone. So if we can leverage that effect we can potentially use outdoor air as a portion of the air that's um, conditioning the space uh, if the conditions are, are right outdoors um, and as i discussed in my response to the last question um, i think that there's a lot of opportunity for flexibility in how you bring that um, cool air into the space at low level to create flexible creative spaces um, yeah, and potentially that can be the kind of 100% mechanical system that you're going to be using in the, that space itself. Fantastic. Thank you, Kara. Um, I know that we have to also think about the outside of the building when we're looking at the mechanics, um, but perhaps we can keep in mind that we keep into the mechanic mode a little bit and start to work to the, the outside exterior of the building. And then we can start to think about the interior, um, you know, the, the the materials and things like that. So, what if we moved? Um, I don't know, Sava. Do you want to add something at this point in terms of what is a must-have for you? Or do you want to noodle it a little longer? Uh, maybe I didn't say uh, Saba correctly. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I was waiting. Um, yes, I mean, what, what Kara said, and usually mechanical uh, design, building performance, architecture, they all go hand by hand. My must have is energy analysis, energy considerations at the table. I think performance spaces uh, are, are not your traditional residential buildings that you can kind of think about without really thinking too much. I think we really need to understand the building and, and the, the way the building functions and the way the building is, the program is intended to, to operate. So having energy analysis or building performance analysis at the table to really understand 
how energy is used through a building, how heat moves, will allow for things like what Carol was, was suggesting in terms of really fully understanding how to make this space as flexible. Um, when we talk about uh, performance spaces, a big driver of energy is um, the, the process equipment that's required for performance and to accommodate performance. There's all sorts of flavor to that, but I think from, from a must-have, we must make that as efficient as possible. Um, these are interior-driven spaces, and when we add heat to the spaces, we have to mechanically get it out. So uh, focusing on, on, on those elements, um, bringing energy considerations to the table, to see what's happening, to understand, to try to prove or disprove our kind of assumptions on, on what we believe works um, are, are, in my mind, um, the key elements to, to this performance space. Um, so yeah. Thanks, Abba. I think that those are important considerations as we start to think about the, the brick and mortar or the walls around it. So thanks so much. Nicole, do you have some thoughts on, on this? And then we'll turn to Dave Peterson after that. Uh, I do. So when we're thinking about the opaque enclosure, you know, normally I talk about what I call the guts of the wall because that's where that performance is coming from. That's where that thermal resistance is coming from. Um, but one of the, you know, for anyone that that saw the the opaque presentations earlier in the week, um, one of the kind of beautiful things about that is that with the uh, exterior insulated wall system we can, you know, we can really make that work behind any exterior cladding. Uh, so I think that with all, with the talk we've been having about indoor and outdoor spaces connecting and the potential of opening up uh, a space, you know, so the performance space kind of spans indoors and outdoors, whether that's, you know, opening up onto a green roof space or um, opening up onto space at grade, uh, looking at the actual, materials that are used on the outside of that cladding which is you know far outside of what i usually talk about um, but looking at those materials and and having some kind of uh consistency between the inside and outside or at least some kind of um you know like harmony between the inside and outside finishes so that when you open up that performance space and you're moving from inside to outside um it feels like you're within the same space. Uh, and one of the, well, actually one of the projects that I talked about in the presentations earlier this week was the National Music Center in Calgary and how they did that. Um, I mean, they used terracotta tiles. You don't have, you, you could use anything. <laughs> um, and that's, you know, I'm not an architect. That's way beyond what I would, <laughs> my expertise, but um, the same kind of concept where you, you connect the inside and outside in that, in that way so that uh, you can have those spaces that bridge across both. Thank you so much, Nicole. Those are great, great things to keep in mind. And I've made note and what, oh, we're sorry, I was going to add one more thing. Leslie was yeah. talking about the windows that you can see yeah. stuff that's happening. And I love those. Um, I have one client who called them truth windows. Um, and I think that having those is incredible because it opens up the space to not only then be, you know, artistic and a performance space, um, but it can become an educational opportunity for, you know, given the city has such um, high performing targets for their buildings. And um, I think, you know, the exact target for this one isn't set, but I think that we're all pretty confident that they're they're going to be targeting something really amazing in terms of energy performance and and all of that good stuff. Um, and so those windows really could become educational opportunities to demonstrate to other people, both you know people in the industry as well as um, people not in the industry, to really see how they can make those same kind of targets come to life if they're involved in um, in the building industry at all, right? You have people who aren't technical that are making decisions sometimes for buildings from a financial point of view or whatever aspect that is. So I think having those uh, having those windows serves a multi-purpose. I think that's a great uh, point to make and that the more purposes a, a measure might serve, the, the more likely it will make it past the 
the um, the budget crunching phase of things. And I think you also did a great job of setting Dave Peterson up for his uh, maybe must have uh, top things that you'd like to have. And then I'm just going to queue up Dave McMillan. I don't know if you wanted to add in, but I thought you might want to add in after Dave Peterson goes, because I, it seems like this might be part of the discussion that you'd like to be included in, if that's fair. I'll give you a minute to think about that before I turn to you. Um, Dave Peterson, would you mind uh, sharing your thoughts on this? Yeah, thanks, Leslie. Um, so for me, th there's a couple of things here. And really not knowing the sort of architectural intent yet, um, you know, I think this is a great starting point because then we're not constrained to certain elevations or details that are already sort of um, drawn in place. Um, so, I mean, I think we, we talked certainly about the natural um, lighting or daylighting component here. Um, the connectivity to views as well, I think, is important. And this is a challenge because this is an existing building that's surrounded by tall buildings. So there's certain view corridors that I think are really important for the occupants in that space to be maintained, to connect with the outdoors, to connect with other design details that are not part of the internal component of the building. Um, passive ventilation, sort of, you know, let, let care systems work efficiently, but when they don't have to, let's give them a rest and let's sort of bring in, um, you know, some passive cooling, let's say. Um, let's make sure that the building is resilient. And I think that's a really important consideration as well, that what happens if we do have a power failure, um, you know, are these components that we're putting in, you know, um, also going to protect that building, protect the occupants in that building for extended periods, regardless if it's winter or summer. Um, in terms of should have, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, and this is almost a must have, it's kind of right on the fence, um, our durable materials and materials that are low in maintenance, that are easy to upgrade, um, and, and to sort of look at life cycle costs from that perspective, because that impacts not just sort of our carbon and body carbon and life cycle carbon, but certainly in terms of the maintenance budgets, um, is this building going to age well? Is it going to be a place of, of sort of beauty and wonder for, for you know, the, the people in the city for years to come? Or is it going to sort of look long in the tooth after five or six years? A lot of the materials that we choose here, um, you know, and how we maintain them, I think are really important considerations as well. Um, maybe not in the short term, but longer term. Um, and I think what we maybe shouldn't have um, are bleeding edge technology. So Mike Singleton talked a bit about that initially, I think in our preamble. Um, and I don't think this building is the place for the bleeding edge uh, tech. Um, it, this has to be sort of tried and true. It has to work together in lockstep with mechanical systems. So passive and active systems have to be well balanced. Um, and I think, you know, in, in achieving those things, and that's no simple task, by the way, um, you know, is really sort of an important consideration because we want this building to look great um, for years to come. Yeah, those are great points. It's really about, um, you know, the innovation can be from using the best available, like informed evidence on how to balance those systems rather than using some flashy new thing. You know, so I think those are great points. It's durability, it's going to last, it's going to be reliable and and be able to serve the, the changing needs of the environment and the communities. Um, Dave McMillan, did you want to offer any thoughts on this? I don't want to put you on the spot, but I want to include you in the discussion. So up to you. Yeah, thanks for that. No, I'm happy to be a part of it uh, if everybody's all right with that. Um, I think maybe I'll pick up on what uh, Dave Peterson was saying with respect to materials, particularly cladding. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, a balance to be struck between aesthetics embodied carbon and thermal performance um there's no perfect material so for example glazing right i think it sounds like the i think everybody can agree that we want this to be a you know a fairly transparent building uh from the outside to welcome people in uh at least to some parts of it and so the amount of glazing that has an impact on both thermal performance and embodied carbon there's a balance to be struck between do we go triple paint or double pain, right? Like in terms, there's a carbon uh, impact there. there. And so, uh, and, and that analysis can be done, of course, uh, but it's a, it's a consideration. And then with the opaque sections, you know, the, the surrounding context is largely brick and Toronto doesn't need to be just a brick city, but there will be feedback, I can guarantee you, from urban design uh, and within city planning uh, regarding brick. Where that brick comes from really matters. There are local options, but they're typically a certain color. There are other options further afield, but the electricity grid that you know uh, powers the kilns that fire those bricks may be quite dirty. So these things really matter when we talk about materials. Terracotta is great, a long time. 
probably not coming from a, re a local or regional source for that matter. So these are all things that we grapple with when we think about embodied carbon and thermal performance and aesthetics. So that, that's really all I, I, just to get into some of the specifics about material choices, because we're going through this exercise right now in a couple of city projects. So I think it's relevant, um, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Yeah, those are great relevant points. And lastly, did you want to take uh, a moment? Um, just a couple of things. And um, in terms of materials, because it is a heritage listed building, there are going to be some attributes that um, the architects are going to have to adhere to. One of the attributes of brutalist architecture is uh, concrete. And so that's going to come into play. Now there will be, there, there, there's concrete, there's also fenestration and glazing and there's also wood, but there's, there, there's heritage is going to weigh in heavily on that. I just wanted to mention that so that we didn't go too far down, <laughs> down the road and thinking about alternative um, ideas yet. Um, and just to something that uh, Dave said, I, I really like the idea, I'm sorry, I forget the word that you used, but basically about sustainability in terms of if we had a power shortage. We use so much power in the performing arts um, in terms of, you know, lights and sound and all of that, and it is a huge problem if there's <laughs> Uh, a shortage or, or an interruption, a massive business interruption. And so I think that's a really interesting idea to think about. I just wanted to lastly say, I didn't want to confuse, I like the idea of kind of low tech in certain areas, but knowing that there's going to be extreme high tech when it comes to um, all things technical in terms of streaming and recording and everything that we're trying to bring this building up to the 21st century in, in, in terms of technology. So I think there's going to be a really interesting balance of the things that we want to be able to have human touch on and the other things that we're going to need technology for. So I, I, I love the idea of where that integration is going to happen. So. If I can say, I think I echo a lot of what, what you said, Leslie and Dave, I think it must have to me in this project is long-term view, a 30 to 50 year analysis, um, especially when you get down to the costing, down to the valuation. We need to evaluate on that long-term because that's when a lot of this, this uh, sustainable technologies make a lot more sense from, from all the, the, the different analysis. The other must have or perhaps won't have that I think it's really important to just commit now and just stick to it is no fossil fuel. Um, and I think, I think it starts here and I think it's something that every time we talk about this project or continue to talk, that needs to be a focal point. If we want this building to be a hub, uh, innovative, sustainable, beyond what we typically do, that, I mean, to me, it's a, it's a must. Um, and the other element and this is more from the energy side. We need to have demonstrated performance and not just design performance and not just um, at this state performance. And I think we need to set up the building in a way that we can demonstrate what we are doing and improve on what we're doing um, year year by year. Those are all great points. Thanks. And maybe you could even tie into Nicole's point about being a, a learning opportunity. Maybe there could be some sharing of data for the, um, you know, the, the community at large. So great, great points. Um, I do want to make sure that we include um, in this must-have kind of phase of things that we haven't heard from Haley Ray, Christine, and Bettina yet, but we did just hear from a couple of folks from the Toronto team. So I wanted to make sure that Devin and Stephen and Sarah, if they wanted to express anything more on this um, must-have, should have, could have um, a part of the discussion that you feel free to, to chime in. Um, before we turn, to, uh, well, maybe what we'll, we'll do is I'll give you a moment to think about that, and I'll turn to Haley Ray now. So that Haley Ray, when you think about this, uh, kind of, uh, we're talking about balancing of uh, passive versus active. We're talking about durable. We're talking about um, potentially adding in the really high tech along with the, the simple tech and and learning and all these different pieces that we've heard from everyone. When we take it from your perspective of making things incredibly accessible and thoughtful considering everyone. What 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 are your must-haves for this creative space design? Thanks, Leslie. Um, 
uh, one of the first things that I think about um, for the must-haves is just consideration for the tension between heritage as um, Leslie brought forth earlier, heritage and accessibility, and both are equally important and just understanding how we move through those tensions to ensure that um, each of those are not, uh, or each of those can be provided in, in the best way um, possible for this specific um, site. Um, must have including, um, uh, I think in the intro slides, um, the idea of going beyond the AODA as an example. So just in general, beyond minimum requirements is, is really important. So, you know, being clear on um, what those evaluation criteria are, what those required reference standards are in such a way that build on what the minimums are um, and considering evidence-based research, um, which um, tends to be a little bit more nimble. Um, it, it takes time for codes and standards to be available and adopted. So um, both considering, you know, what is sort of legislated with what um, the current and evolving better practices are. Um, some more specific must-haves that come to mind are, um, and these are sort of specific uh, design strategies, um, but universal washrooms with adult size change tables installed, not just space for. Um, in thinking about areas where um, audiences are, are viewing performances, um, emphasizing the choice in viewing for those clear floor spaces, for the adaptable seating, for the companion seating, um, especially where there are sort of multi-level um, viewing areas provided. Um, consideration, again, for that viewing area not just to be sort of stuck on the side in the back left or back right or front left or front right um, but throughout the sort of seating plan um, uh, the design of the seats themselves especially for folks who choose to um, transfer out of their mobility device if um, required onto the seat itself um, generally just providing larger clear turning spaces throughout the entire facility um, particularly at um, uh, sort of maneuvering areas, front entrances, within washrooms, in those sort of key um, uh, amenity areas. Um, the idea of assistive listening devices, which from a minimum standards and code uh, perspective are required in classrooms and auditoria and meeting rooms in theaters, um, but it's generally contingent on um, the occupant load of 75, but the idea of providing it in all of those spaces, regardless of the occupant load, as well as providing them at service counters where those are provided, um, should have. Um, the idea of if feature stairs are provided, ensuring that those are co-located with accessible uh, vertical circulation opportunities, so don't hide the elevator behind other pieces of architecture, but make sure that it's in sort of clear sight lines from those feature opportunities. Uh, consideration for gender inclusive washrooms, but also equity between male, female washrooms. I think I used this example yesterday of being at a performance and oftentimes the line to access the female washroom is multiple times longer than the, the male washroom. Um, the idea of um, baby change tables in all washrooms. I'm not sure to what extent, um, uh, you know, children may, or babies in particular are included in these spaces during performances, but ensuring that um, those are provided in all washrooms regardless of gender. Um, when folks were speaking about the, the viewing windows from, I guess, the streetscape, that, that really intrigued me. And I think from a sort of access and equity perspective, that's really exciting. Um, from an accessibility perspective, um, consideration for those clear sight lines for folks, whether they're seated or standing or of short stature, um, but also the multimodal approach to that. So um, there's a very clear, um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a seeing experience, it's a window. You're not necessarily being able to hear what's on the other side. So consideration for how someone with low to no vision can also make use of that sort of snapshot of what's going on in the interior. Um, uh, and then throughout the facility, some could have um, consideration for child friendly and age friendly um, design ideas, um, if especially, especially if there are specific sort of programming throughout any of these spaces, just ensuring that um, those needs are considered. And 
Um, again, this is related to won't have something that I think I spoke about yesterday um, during my plenary um, presentation, but um, won't have uh, hangout steps and stramps are just continuously very problematic for um, the disability community for a, a number of reasons. So avoid those where possible. There's lots to unpack there. Thank you so much. I think uh, Leslie has something to add and there's something in the chat. Kara, one of the key water efficiency and time efficiency measures for washroom and performance spaces is allowing people for whom urinals work to make access to them. A way to make the gender friendly is to sign all washrooms with the fixture available to washrooms. Uh, yeah, so according to what's available in the washroom. So this washroom has um, adult change. So if there is limitations of fit, yeah, that's a great point. Thanks, thanks, Kara. Sorry, Leslie, did you have something to add? And is there anything also from the other team members from Toronto that maybe you want to add as well? Um, just a very small point. Um, thank you for all of that. It's all wonderful and, and absolutely be taken into consideration. Um, and I think the idea of, of being much better than AODA is a must. And we talked about it a lot. And so it is it is on us and the team to, to make sure that happens. I just wanted to add a very small point, but a really important one. We talk about the neighborhood a lot. It is incredibly multi-dimensional in terms of age and family and culture. We think about uh, the intergenerational play all the time. Right now in the test fit, there is what I'm just labeling a kid's zone. Um, it's very specific. It may be something that would be comparable to uh, a kind of daycare for anyone who's working in the building or in the neighborhood, or it also could be, you know, a big ballroom somewhere where people are going to be hanging out and playing during performances or not. So the idea of, of all ages being um, welcome to this building, I think is really, really critical. So thank you for all the mention of that because I think it's important. Thanks so much, Leslie, appreciate that. Um, were there any uh, additional thoughts from the rest of the, or the other team members from Toronto that are on the line from Devin, Stephen and Sarah? I haven't seen you chime in at this point, but I know we haven't gotten to um, Bettina. We haven't heard from Mike on, and Christine for this final round of uh, must have, could have, should have. Bettina, I see your hand is up. Would you yeah. like to go next? I'll go very quickly and very specifically. For me, a must have is healthy materials. And by that, I mean healthy materials for both the planet, embodied carbon has to be front of mind and for people. And so the, and people, we have both the, the biophilia of the materials. We feel welcome and we feel like we belong when there are natural materials, materials that, that belong to us. And uh, the could have this idea of, of connecting. I, I despair a little bit about this idea of three stories down and people working, experiencing, living like moles in that area. I, for me, the could have it, and I, you know, I know it will be difficult, but not just natural light, but natural air, some way of making, you know, con considering is that the way to do it? Or if we do it, then how can we make that not three stories down in a bunker feel? Uh, the should have, sorry, I had it written down here. Uh, the should have is balance. So balancing this idea. That we say we want this interconnectivity with windows and, and with allowing people in and allowing light in and allowing all of that, but finding the balance. It doesn't mean floor to ceiling windows. And taking Haley's point, Haley Ray's point about ensuring that these, these moments when people can look or listen in or touch in that they're uh, that they're balanced with the energy efficiency of the building. We don't, you know, can we make strips of windows or or little uh, peak holes so that there is that balance? Uh, and I guess, yeah, in the essence of time, I'll... there's plenty of time, Bettina. Don't don't feel that you have to rush your responses. Um, I want everyone to feel that they have the opportunity to really share their thoughts and don't feel rushed off the line because we will be breaking, somebody just asked, we will be having a, a short 15 minute kind of coffee bio break uh, in about 10 minutes around approximately. 
um, and then we'll re break again at noon for lunch. So we'll try to make sure that we can hear from everybody and we'll break at a natural moment when that works. Um, so I wanted to make sure that we got everyone's voice on these uh, final, sorry, I, Haley Ray, we did hear from you. So then uh, Christine and Mike, you are on the list of people that we haven't heard from for the Moscow, the must have, could have. And then if, um, again, just want to make sure that the, the welcome is there for anyone else to add in last thoughts as well. So did, Mike, I see you just turned on your camera. Would you like to go next? Sure. Um, thank you, uh, Leslie. Yeah, so we, uh, I guess I would just echo uh, something that Seba said. Um, uh, and I think it's it's more than just no fossil fuels. I think we need to uh, really um, draw a line in the sand with uh, zero carbon. And, um, uh, you know, John Robinson, I don't believe he's on the line today, but he would say, he would take even further and say positive carbon. So uh, the whole uh, philosophy or the whole sort of, um, yeah, philosophy of, of a positive environment, positive carbon, positive uh, energy, so net positive. So um, uh, giving back more than more than we use, if you will, on both the carbon and energy front. I think that's uh, that's really critical. It aligns more or less with the Transform Toronto um, goals uh, that we heard about, I guess, yesterday. Um, so I think that's that's really a must-have. And I'll, I think I'll. Um, defer to the others in terms of what we uh, what we've heard regarding you know kind of should have uh, could have and so on. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mike. Um, and I know that what, there will be some overlap in the discussions between creative spaces, innovative spaces, flexible spaces. Those the bubbles that we saw at the beginning of the different types of spaces. But as we narrow into the specifics around those, I think we'll come up with some more, more unique ideas regarding that particular discussion point. So just to call that out before we move forward. Um, I do want to make sure that we can give Christine a chance to share, you know, when you talk about those those blue sky, green green sky ideas, how do you get them into that sort of funnel of what are the must-haves and could-haves and should-haves that you'd like to express here? Yes, yeah, thank you. And I was going to say, there's, there is an over a little bit of overlap between you know my blue sky and what what are the could haves and should haves, um, but there are some must haves and I think part of the must haves is that really talking about when we when I spoke about green roofs that we really need to find a way to make these active green roofs and activate these green roofs and not just make them passive spaces. We realize that the people are looking down on them. We realize that that's in many cases when we do these green roofs they just become passive spaces that are just a visual space. But I think. A must-have here would be to at least make some of these green roofs active green roofs and active spaces so that people can engage with them. And that may be involved. That may involve us looking at intensive green roofs as opposed to just a sea of ex extensive green roofs in the spaces. So that's that's one thing we we need to look at. And 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 the other thing is, and and people haven't talked about this, but this is kind of why I'm here is, um, as we look out towards the outer area, I think one of the things that we need to look at is that there will be a need to revision the streetscape um, in front of the building. Um, there are some existing street trees there. Um, a lot of what's out there looks is just tired. And so as we move forward, it would be this opportunity to create this totally re-envisioned space and a re-envisioned streetscape. You know, um, that really does try to incorporate some new technologies with respect to um, street trees. Um, how do we create a really um, viable environment for these street trees so that um, 10 years down the line, they still don't look like twigs sitting out in front of the building? That we create an environment for these trees that they that do encourage them to grow and, and be part of this urban force that we're trying to encourage within the, within the green area. And then just quickly, lastly, one of the things that I think that is a must have that we're going to have to look at is um, the, the, the paving materials that, that, that are part of this whole exterior space. One of the concerns is, is that um, we know that this, this is a heritage building with some, as Leslie noted, you know, a lot of concrete as part of the, the, the nature of the brutalist architecture. Um, but one of the major contributors and in, in the concerns about embedded carbon is, is that concrete paving. And so we're going to have to move away from that and, and try to find some um, climate positive um, paving solutions for the, for the area. Um, and one that will withstand the foot traffic that's going to be in this, in this space. So we're not talking about, you know, um, Adding more 
adding more concrete or adding more unit pavers to this urban environment. And, and we have to look at other options that aren't, you know, uh, what's suggested often is, is, is stabilized uh, aggregates or bonded aggregates or gravel and, and wood decking. That's not an option for here. So it's, we're now looking at options like natural stone, which, which does have a, a lower carbon footprint. So, though, but has a cost attached to it. So I think those are the things that become some of the must haves as we look at trying to create and envelop the spaces that are part of the exterior of this building. And then I'll, I'll leave the rest because, um, I, even though we are, you say we don't have, we, we have lots of time. I, I don't want to, um, regurgitate and reiterate my, my codas and should have from my blue sky. Okay. That sounds great. Thank you so much, Christine. I think um, I, what I think this might be a natural moment to for us to uh, move towards our first break of the day, uh, rather than holding on for five minutes and then stopping at, at our next discussion point. I feel like it's a more natural segue. So what what we're going to do is um, we're going to share a link through all the different platforms that people are chimed in on uh, that will be a link to a word cloud. The word cloud is a question around, um, you know, try to see if I can get my slide on that. What creative ideas do you think are important for this project? And that word cloud will be available to all members of this session, and that means all students as well as all collaborators. So if there are some things that you wanted to jot into that word cloud between now and the time that we return, I'll share the word cloud results. Um, when we come back to see what are the things that resonated with more people uh, of the students? What are, the, what are your big takeaways? What do you want to make sure that your, uh, your voice is being heard through this process as well? So you may not be a member of the, the collaborators, but we certainly can hear your thoughts through this process. So um, with that, I would like to offer us a, a 15 minute break. It is now 12 after 10. Let's say we'll be back at, um, what are we gonna say? Uh, 28, why don't we say 10.30? Is that reasonable? Give people another minute so they can do the word cloud and we'll come back at 10.30. Great. Thanks everyone, I'm seeing thumbs up. Wonderful, we'll see you shortly.
like. And there's green. Welcome back, everyone. I will uh, let everyone take a, a moment to get settled back to their seats and on camera. Uh, and while we're taking that moment, I'm sharing the word cloud results. So those of you that participated in the word cloud, thank you so much for typing in a few words around what you heard or what you think are the must haves and could haves when we talk about the creative um, spaces uh, for the, the project design. And I will be um, definitely taking note of these as part of the, the report when, that we prepare for TO Live. Um, the, that word cloud will stay open. If you feel so inclined to add another word along the lines, feel free to do so. Um, if we have time, we might be doing another one of those word clouds um, as we, we move through the next session. Uh, then the other thing, I'm getting back into the PowerPoint now. I think everyone can see my slides. I was thinking about this uh, next session while we were on our break, and I recognize that there is quite a bit of overlap when we think about that creative space and what we might do from all the different perspectives that are around the collaboration tables here. And then when we think about innovative spaces. And I think there were a few things that came out in the last discussion that fit within this area of innovative spaces. So we, we heard about, you know, we want to have the Wi-Fi or the high tech human touch components. We want to have, um, we want to be the space to be flexible and, and, and adaptive. That was one of the adaptive, I think we've heard quite a bit of. Um, I think that there's that need to harmonize the feel of the space with the needs of the space and, and uh, making sure that if you're having, uh, you know, windows that they can be covered for the purpose of performance. So there's a lot of talking around that, that use of innovation for the spaces. And this is one of the areas that came out of the stakeholder consultation that was, is a desired part of the vision. And so when we think about it in practice, the words here, I'm going to read it, the building will be multi-use facility with functionally optimized specific performance spaces that meet the current gaps in the arts ecosystem for the communities in Toronto. So when we consider that in terms of innovative spaces, I, I, my thought is that we don't maybe need to go quite as in depth in this discussion, but perhaps just take a round table and say, is there something that we didn't already hear or didn't, you didn't already share that we might want to consider when it comes to an innovative space idea? So if that is okay with everyone, I'm um, going to look for thumbs up. Yeah, got a couple thumbs up. That's great. Thank you so much. So we're going to do a round table then. Um, and I can, I'm going to go around based on the people, the, the order that was on my original slide of introductions, <clears throat> which means, uh, Seba, you're going to go last, but later I'll make you go first. So, uh, so then we'll start, if it's okay with Bettina, um, we can start with Bettina, but that, we're going to skip Kara because I think she's off for, uh, she's away from her camera for another five or 10 minutes. So then we'll go uh, from Bettina, we'll go to Christina and Dave Peterson, and then you'll see who comes next. Um, so Bettina, over to you. Uh, perfect. So from an innovative, uh, taking this idea of flexibility and technology, obviously that the first comment that I was talking about today was, was crystal clear that uh, the interest in having the ability to uh, see and experience the performances uh, virtually, definitely that's top of mind. Uh, taking from the word cloud, I found it very interesting that the first word that came up was resilience. And we also know, uh, I happened to live in this neighborhood and the other day when there was the giant power cut, uh, everyone in the buildings flowed out into the city and we happened to have a relatively nice day. And uh, there weren't a lot of places of refuge. And so for me, when I think about combining those two ideas, how can we make this, how can we innovatively consider making this a, an 
an, an area of refuge for the neighborhood, for this, the people who are working in this area, and also taking that idea of, of area of refuge, art is an area of refuge for you know many people just on a personal level, and, and how can we have these spaces that take into consideration all of these many needs? Thanks so much, Bettina. I hope I didn't distract people. I threw the word for uh, the word cloud back up because you mentioned it, and I thought it might be helpful to see those words as we're thinking through these innovations and or innovative spaces ideas. Uh, and I love that area of refuge to take that into consideration and the points that you've made. Thanks so much. So we'll move. Um, if if it's okay, we'll move to Christine. Sorry. Thank you. I mean, I was looking at that word cloud as well, and. I was a little bit puzzled, <laughs> so pouring more concrete um, and the suggestion of that. Um, I'm not sure if that was pouring more concrete right to the bottom right-hand side. Um, I'm not sure if that was intentional, if that was... Um, it looks like it's cut off. So uh, maybe I should have made more clarity around there's a, a, a limitation in the number of characters you can put into the word cloud. So it might be that somebody wasn't as familiar with the word cloud idea, but we can we can look into that. It, oh. Right. But but that's but anyways, but when I saw that, I also thought, and this is great if you want to keep it on there, because some of these ideas of welcoming and plaza, I mean, I think we touched on that already about creating these these urban spaces that the connected urban spaces that, that would be um part of this. Um but but there's other things that we were I was thinking about that, that could be incorporated and we haven't touched on this and that that that's about um gray water. It's about the reuse of that gray water, um, but water harvesting, um, stormwater and um and the reuse of stormwater and um whether or not it's through the irrigation, um and if we have all of this green and green that hopefully my two have all the green um in there. That there there would be the ability for us to reuse the stormwater in the irrigation systems for those for those uh, green areas, um, or you know in association with that you know in conjunction with that also look at the reuse of gray water, and so what can we do for that as well? So I would have added, and I try to go in there, and I didn't take my word, but I, I, my word I was going to add was gray water. So how do we how do we incorporate those thoughts? Of, of stormwater and gray water um, and the reuse of such on site. I think that's such an important point, uh, Christine. Thanks so much. And I'll make sure that I add it in on your behalf. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Of course, um, and so uh, we and we see that in so many parts of the world, world, right? The use of gray water. I think it's happening more and more in Toronto. So we'll make that point. Um, on the my introduction slide, the next person I have is actually Dave Peterson. So Dave, can I send it to you for your thoughts uh, on roundtable and innovation? Thanks, Leslie. Yeah. Um, so. You know, I think these concepts are really interesting in terms of how they might interconnect. It might be interesting to sort of sort of connect some of these terms with with some lines to see which ones are can be grouped in, into sort of key components or, or common components and then sort of build upon those. Um, you know, I love the idea again, and, and this is sort of less from from my specialty, just more about maybe if I put myself as a as a um, as a tourist in that space. Um, I recall when I was a kid um, at Pier Four. Uh, Toronto Harbour Front, there was a really neat interactive artist community there that worked out of that space. And they were metal artists and glass blowers. Uh, maybe that got me somewhat into my um, niche as well with the glazing uh, side of the equation. But I remember that was an open space and you could go in and watch these people and interact with them, not maybe during their, their uh, artistic endeavor, but certainly afterwards. And they could explain things that you were seeing, you could ask questions. Um, so this interaction, you know, this connection, I think, is is important with the artists in that space. And I think it's equally important that the building itself interacts with us, um, and especially from a materiality perspective. So I like the fact that we're talking about low carbon. We're talking about, Bettina mentioned, biophilic materials, because regardless of what's happening in that space, that building can be compelling just to to, to spend time alone in and, and sort of just connect with with the greater sort of ether. 
Um, and I'll use an example, another one in the city of Toronto, which is um, AGO, and that beautifully designed and, and incredibly intricate sort of north-facing sort of waveform um, fully glazed window wall, which is actually a com combination of, of, of structural metals connecting to, to timber. Um, and then the glazing is sort of, again, connected to that. So we're talking about materials, I think, that are consistent with this, this, this building's typology. It's, it's sort of architectural heritage. Um, but this, again, makes us feel special in that space, regardless of what's going on in that space or around that space. And so the building itself, I think, really sort of informs that, um, regardless of, of sort of the people and, and, and sort of those uses. So I think a beautiful building should be a, a great place for us to collaborate and, and work with others and, and sort of be part of a, a crowd. It also, I think, has to work efficiently and effectively if we're just there alone, sitting and contemplating life in general. And especially after the last couple of years with COVID, I think that's something that's, that a lot of us have, have missed, just sort of finding place. And if this building can actually help us with that and connect us to, to the place in, in, the, in the community, then um, you know, I think those are really, really worthy goals. Oh, I love that, Dave. I think I especially love that idea of the ether, like the, the, the building itself has an energy, has a spirit that, it's, it's, it, that you're connecting with beyond um, the actual physical moment, but it's like a feeling. Um, so I, I think that's, that's, that's a really beautiful uh, mindset to bring to this. So thanks so much. Um, so moving around the circle, the next person I have on my list, if uh, I'm not putting you on the spot, is Haley Ray. Thanks, Leslie. Um, I think when thinking about this question, um, one of the first things I think of is uh, sort of aesthetically beautiful and delightful in that accessible and inclusive spaces um, when they're innovative should be that, you know, chef's kiss, um, that they are celebrated and praised um, and so well integrated and coordinated into the project that you do and you don't notice them in that obviously we don't want to hide accessibility features, um, but that they should be easily available. Um, and so it doesn't require that sort of um, mental gymnastics of, wait, where is it that I, what is it that thing that I need? Because it's hidden in such a way. Um, thinking about, you know, if a feature sort of circulation piece needs to be added into the, into the project, that maybe it's not a feature stair, maybe it's a feature ramp and maybe it's that accessible feature that is the thing that um, people want to go and use and visit and take photos of and what you see sort of celebrated on the various medias in which <laughs> celebrate um, design in the built environment. Um, and just thinking about uh, innovation, you know, thinking um, when we think about like adaptability and flexibility and anything that is sort of technology based, that those things um, inherently provide um, that one size fits one that um, inclusive design for the user. Great, great point to, to integrate the accessibility in a way, but that it's understood and, and available for use and not hidden. Uh, great points. And I love the idea of a feature ramp or a feature of ex around accessibility to showcase um, that accessibility mindset. That's very, very great points. Uh, thanks so much. Um, the next person on our round table at this point is Nicole. Oh, yeah, sorry, Michael Singleton. Oh, he might have stepped away. Sorry, I wasn't, I wasn't quite ready, sorry. Um, I think uh, for me, there's, uh, you, and Dave mentioned uh, a really um, iconic building, uh, the, the art gallery, and I think, uh, there's an opportunity to create something that is really distinctive um, and really kind of um, uh, exciting. And you think about these iconic um, uh, buildings in in the city of Toronto, like Toronto City Hall. I mean that 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 is that's such a distinctive building, and um, you know probably you know the architect at the time I believe was Rebelli. I mean, didn't consider some of the things that we're talking about, but it has be become one of the most distinctive buildings um, in Canada, in a way. And I think when you, you know, when you look at uh, that view of the city, when you're looking from the east side and you see the the um, the Goodrum Wards building, the Triangle building there, 
and you see the L building in the background and you see some really iconic buildings. I think this building has the opportunity to to take its place uh, in in that really distinctive list of of iconic buildings. And I think that could be um, really exciting. And you know, we've already talked about and we're hearing about all the other things that it that it needs to have. Um, but but you know, I think this and, and Haley just to build on what Haley Ray said is this is there's an opportunity to really make a statement um, with this building and uh, and you know. Um, Let's not lose sight of that and the desire to create a, you know, super efficient, uh, sustainable building as well, because, um, you know, at the end of the day, that look and feel of a building is what's going to appeal to people, it seems to me. Yeah, thanks, Mike. That's good, uh, good, good perspectives to remember that it's all interconnected. It all goes together and it needs to go together in a way that that complements the desired objectives as well as the um, intended usages. So thanks so much. Um, so moving on in the round table, the next person I have on the list is Nicole. Uh, so talking about flexibility and uh, thinking about what we had been talking about earlier about the potential to, to kind of have a blurring of inside and outside spaces and passive ventilation and all of that kind of uh, stuff is fantastic in, you know, good weather, um, but we're we're limited by, uh, and I mean, we're getting so much less good weather because we're getting such extreme heat in the summer with climate change. And of course, you know, it's Toronto in the winter and it's cold. Uh, so I was thinking about, but I was thinking about how, um, you know, people still love to, be outside in the winter, right? When we think about the the market at the distillery district uh, at the end of every year, like it's it's packed. Even if it's minus twenty outside, people are bundled up. They're they're going. They're experiencing uh, that outdoor market. So um, one thing that I was thinking and related to the enclosure um, is the flexibility to have spaces as either outdoor or indoor spaces. So. If you're, you know, if there's a space where you can open up, you know, whether it's a giant slide, you know, glass enclosure or whether it's it's opaque or whatever it is, but where you can open it up to join that inside and outside space, um, looking at then having uh, the the walls that are, you know, usually inside walls um, designed and built as an exterior enclosure as well, having uh, something to separate that space from the space that will be remaining indoor space. So it's I mean, kind of like a vestibule, but a you know giant, <laughs> giant vestibule so that you, you can open it up and make it outdoor space. Um, of course, then the, there would be mechanical considerations because if you if you opened up a space to be outdoor, you would want to be able to cut it off from the mechanical systems for that period of time. Um, but I think being able to to do that so that you can expand your outdoor space when needed, when it makes sense um, for for performances that may be outdoors, even when it is, you know, cold. I'm thinking in the middle of, of winter, um, you know, we, <laughs> we, we don't, we as, you know, citizens of Toronto, Ontario, and Canada don't really seem to mind the cold. We still do all that outdoor stuff in the winter. So having that as a possibility um, and, and designing some of those walls as exterior walls, even though the majority of the time they're probably going to be interior walls. I love that um, adapt. And you're you're spilling a thunder a little bit for our inside outside discussion later, Nicole. <laughs> but it's, these are great points, and I think it's worthy to make. It's worth making them more than once rather than not making them at all. And I love, uh, it, it's so important to be able to to adapt the space to accommodate the weather and also the intention. So thanks for, for your points there. Um, Seba. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's great to be last, by the way, because I get to hear all these awesome ideas and kind of get inspired. Um, same thing with the workflow, by the way. Um, I, I picked a few of the words from there and kind of Want to try to build a little bit on it. I, I echo what Bettina said in terms of place of refuge and, and then the importance of, of turning this into that that uh, that space for the neighborhood. 
Um, taking it from an energy perspective, I think making sure that from the from a design perspective, we are doing what's called passive survivability tests. So that idea of what happens to the building if there's a power outage, um, what happens into the spaces from a thermal perspective, can they become places of refuge, and how do we build that into the, the design? I think I think really really echoes with me. Um, the other another word that I found or or, or that I kind of was drawn to. Um, was inviting and the principle behind kind of making this design inviting uh, and some ideas around uh, programming and and drawing from. So I live in Corktown. It's really close to Regent Park and I had the opportunity, my kids go to, Cor to Regent Park school and seeing the redevelopment of, of Regent Park is really inspiring and it's definitely something that, that this project can, can take a look and, and see um, elements like on the programming side, including uh, libraries, community centers, adult classes as a way to uh, really break that gap between this is a performance art center, this is a cultural hub, this is a neighborhood, and really foster those, those serendipitous connections. And, and I mean, the other word that I saw, multi-generational, I think it's really important to keep in mind and, and catering to not only from an accessibility perspective, from an age perspective, and making sure the program speaks to the neighborhood from a cultural perspective as well, I think it's it's, it's really important and really really inspires me and, and drives um, the idea of modularity uh, from a, from a design perspective, from a flexibility perspective. If we can start designing for spaces that are modular in construction, we get high efficiencies from that, but also allows us to play and be flexible with um, with those spaces. So, so those are just some of the, the thoughts that came came out from from just hearing and looking at, at that work. Thanks so much, Sebastian. I appreciate that. Um, is uh, David McMillan? Did you want to share anything around the innovative uh, space design? Yeah, I thanks. I I think we should talk a little bit about the roof. Um, you know, it's we have the advantage here of pursuing a low carbon. Solution solution that is very likely, depending on what it is, it may move a lot of the rooftop equipment off of the roof. Uh, it, it may be underground, either within the footprint of the building or nearby. Uh, there still will be some equipment up there, but there will be more space available than, than typically. Uh, again, the technology is to be determined and that, that would shift how much space is available. But the, the reason I think it's important, so my sister is uh, an opera singer, and I know that before a performance, she appreciates having her private space, her and her colleagues, right? The rooftop, it's not great for public spaces, obviously, but uh, I think the emphasis should be on public space first and foremost, and there's a lot of that pr proposed. But I think a private space is also useful, and it doesn't have to be just for those who are using the facility like as performers. It could be, and I think that would be helpful. It could also be a venue space, like, You'd have a great you'd have, you would have a great north view of Berksy Park unencumbered, right? Obviously, there'd be a bit of shading to the south, but I mean, you know, uh, I think there's a creative design solution that could be employed. It doesn't just have to be your typical green roof that just gets forgotten and turns yellow. It could be something more, uh, you know, more valuable to use. It's only five stories. I think it would be actually a pleasant environment. Uh, you know, if that's what the design ends up, it's not going to be a tall building. Is my point. So. I think uh, the roof is is potentially a valuable space. I love that, David. Thank you so much for sharing. And I wonder because uh, that we we haven't actually narrowed in on on this, and it sort of speaks to what uh, Haley Ray was saying around you know have that have these things integrated and and make them useful and 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 help people know that they're there, um, so that they're obvious. So how do we? Uh, make the green roof, if that's what we end up doing, it'd be an inviting space and a space that maybe performers can use pre-performance to calm nerves or to be, you know, connected with nature or um, the community can also access a, and a venue space, as David mentioned. There's a lot of opportunities there that we haven't really unpacked. So perhaps it's worth taking a moment to to share our thoughts on on things that we might consider for the green roof. And I know Christine might have some thoughts on this, and I don't want to put her on the spot because I notice she's off camera right now. But why don't we just open it up for anyone that wants to share a thought? You you join, jump in, and if everyone talks at once, I'll I'll, I'll facilitate. But hopefully, it'll just be a dinner table conversation here. So 
We're not hearing you, Christine. There you go. There you go. Oh, so Joan's going to start. I, I was just about to say that if no one's going to start, I can throw some stuff out there. Um, when I said earlier, I, I mentioned the term active green roof. And, and what I meant by that was that, you know, there is that perception throughout the city. We do have a number of green roofs that are inaccessible. They're, they're at the very top of the roof. They are just um, extensive green roofs. And maybe I can, and for those who don't know the difference between extensive in, in, and intensive green roofs, there are two types of green roofs. Um, the first is the extensive green roof, is that low profile green roof that you see throughout the city. It predominantly the vegetation on there is sedums, so they're low maintenance, drought tolerant, and they're they're growing in a very, very thin amount of growing media, but they're, they're thin profile. So eight inches or less within within the growing medium of these things. <clears throat> so that that's the kind of green roof you see a lot throughout the city. Um, but in order to create a real active green roof, a, a green roof that people can and can um, you know enter into and really kind of um, enjoy the space, we we often like to integrate what's called an intensive green roof. And an intensive green roof allows us at the deeper soil depth, <clears throat> and it allows us to grow things beyond the sedum. So we can still can grow sedums in our office. But we can actually grow things for, from to perennial, flying perennial, to shrub, to trees. And then that really does create these outdoor rooms that are on the roof. And then we do a lot of these new spaces and, and we program these spaces so that they become active spaces and active usable spaces. So the deeper front, the deeper the planter, the more water it consumes with respect to irrigation and greater the opportunity to reuse water from the cistern in the storm water. There is, a, there is um, mandated that we must reuse that water from that cistern as part of, part of the development requirements. And so how do we reuse that water in urban environments? Irrigation, number one, with use. And it's the most common use and it is the most useful tool we have in order to reuse that storm water. But, and the deeper the soil, the deeper the material is, and trees and shrubs, more water they use, as opposed to the low profile, um, four inches, two inches, four inches, six inches, eight inches of soil <clears throat> that we're using to grow these little sedum, small little um, sedums on there. And the sedums are, um, are tiny little uh, fleshy leaves, mature plants. So when we have these bigger beds, when we have these uh, shrubs and trees, that really does create what we consider a more activated green roof, a space that people can program, a space that people can use. And that can be anything from the patron at the theater, or, you know, as Julie suggested, a, a space for the performers that, that, or the workers. And that's when I said, I said, this opportunity to create these green spaces on these green roofs. We haven't seen what the green roof, excuse <clears throat> me, the work roof will be for this building. We don't know what it's going to be because that, that's yet to be determined. It may be a terrace roof. There may be opportunities that there are various terraces on this roof uh, um, as we progress up these four stories. And, and it's not just a box with a four stories and a flat roof on the top. That's hopefully not. So if the, if the roof line of the building does terrace up, there are opportunities that on these terraces as we progress up to the upper roof, there may be opportunities to create some of these more activated spaces, these more active green roofs with the higher planting areas. So that's where we may have these opportunities to create spaces for performers, for offices. Um, if you had a space for the, for the employees to go out and eat their lunch outside, there was an outdoor terrace that had planting around them, had trees on these terraces. That's all a possibility. And that's often what we do when we're creating these, these these terraces and these spaces. And as I said, the deeper the bed, the more water it uses, which is really good for, for respect to water balance and the consumption of water. And we're not talking about potable water, we're talking about reused and recaptured storm water. So that's a great as aspect of, of creating these really great active roofs. When we get to the upper roof, it's a balance between equipment, balance between, there's a lot of conflicting people uses that want up there, whether or not it's for solar, um, panels, whether or not it's for mechanical equipment in a, in, in green roof, and there's always this this fight for spaces up there. There's on, on how do we actually 
you know, buy for space with window washing, mechanical equipment, and a bunch of other things that need to go onto these roofs. But there is still an opportunity on that upper roof to then create um, uses up there and, like I said, another activated large space. You know, but there's a possibility. Is, 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 there is there discussions about a commercial kitchen. Is there a restaurant on this upper roof? If this restaurant's on this upper roof, is there a portion of that restaurant? There's a dining area that you can have outdoor dining that's surrounded by trees, surrounded by shrubs, and this urban environment that overlooks Currency Park. So there's a lot of these opportunities that we could utilize when we're looking at these greeneries. And a lot of them have to do functionally. A lot of them have to do with about sustainability. But some of them have to do with aesthetics as well. So it's about this balance that we can actually achieve on these spaces. Mm -hmm. I think this is an incredible opportunity. <clears throat> and when we say roof, there is just so much opportunity for us to do um, and create spaces on this in this building. So um, I, I'll leave it at that to see if other people have other ideas that they want to incorporate and, and suggest for those spaces as well. Thanks, Christine. Lots, lots of great ideas there. And when you talk about a uh, rooftop restaurant, I do think about vegetable garden, uh, talk about farm table. Leslie, I think you had some thoughts on this. I know you talked earlier about this being a, a vista for the neighboring condominiums. And what are your, did you want to add some, some additional? Um, well, I, I won't, I won't say anything more about the idea of uh, kitchen and restaurant and vegetables because Christine just mentioned it. So that, that I think is um, a very interesting one or there's always bees and pollinators etc cetera, etc cetera. so there's l lots of lots of ideas around that the one thing that i wanted to add though was part of the rfp process there is going to be uh, an in um, an introduction which i'm you probably touched upon this week a little bit but there will be a collaboration with an indigenous architect and indigenous artists and I think that um, this is not my uh, space to speak to, but I think there's going to be a lot of interesting ideas that come up and how do we indigenize the space, particularly outside, particularly the fact that we're on the shoreline of Lake Ontario. Um, what does this mean with the outside world and the inside world? What is ceremonial that we can imagine on the rooftops, um, anything medicinal, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that there's, uh, a whole area there to explore again um, not something that I'm that I feel comfortable speaking exactly to right now but I know it'll be incorporated in the RFP process thank you so much for saying that Leslie I think it's so important to re to remember that this process will include more voices and and we're ha I think the, the workshop here is great opportunity to share these perspectives and Bettina I see your you feel like you're itching to say something. Yeah, just one thing, and, and we seem to be talking about the roof and the, the, the downstairs, but there is outdoor space possibility on every floor. And just to, to, to remember to open our minds to that, ways of incorporating. We know that balconies from a thermal perspective uh, can be dangerous, but maybe creative ways of incorporating outdoor space on the outside of the building as well. So, so can I just interject for just a second? Somebody mentioned um, vegetable gardens and things, and I just wanted to be cautioning you on vegetable gardens. Mm -hmm. The water for that vegetable garden must be harvested rainwater through rain barrels. You cannot, or potable water. You cannot use harvested vegetables using captured rainwater from the cistern. That cistern, unless you go to extreme measures in which to treat that captured water from the cistern to be used for um, consumables. Um, the water coming from the cistern is untreated and it could contain numerous pathogens and or chemicals that are have on its way into that system. So when you're doing these vegetable gardens on these roofs for urban gardening, um, that would have to be watered, as I said, from a rain barrel or potable. And if we're looking at reducing the, uh, the, re the use of potable water, that means that that garden is only watered by a, a rain barrel. So captured water from the rain barrel. That is separate from the cistern. So it's just something that you need to be careful of. If you're working this into your program that you're saying that we want to do these, these gardens, just understand if you're going to be consuming the, the product coming off of 
anything that's growing in there. We can't put in the, into the soil water that is untreated and is, is, is could be full of bacteria and or other as, as other pathogens. So you just have to be conscious of that when when um, people are creating these um, urban gardens. We were just as an anecdote. We were involved um, over on um, on York Street in Bremner, um, the Telus building, and we did that over by Maple Leaf Square. <clears throat> and they, we have a green roof on the top of that. We found out after the building was occupied, <clears throat> excuse me, that the um, tenants and the employees of Telus were growing vegetables up on the roof and, and rerouting the, the rainwater from the cistern that was being used to irrigate. From shrub beds into vegetable beds it becomes a huge issue because that is not treated water. That is not safe water to be planting and used for vegetables. It does not be for OBC unless it is treated up to a potable standard. So we we found this out. We sort of notified them full stop. You can't eat the vegetables coming off this roof. They said, Oh, we've grown tomatoes all season long. Are you telling me we can't eat it? But you can't eat those vegetables. You cannot eat vegetables. That have been grown from from rainwater coming, or not from rainwater, from harvested water coming out of the cistern. It's coming out of the parking lot. It's coming off the roof. It's coming off the, the paving. It's coming from all these areas that's being captured and reused, and we can't guarantee the safety of that water. So, and so we had to we had create a whole new system for them to do <clears throat> to do these vegetable gardens and to convert those beds they were using back into flower beds because that that. In, in interpreted it as a safe use of their water. So just be caution, just a caution to you when thinking about things like gardens and crops. It's a different scenario than than just um, an ornamental garden that we're going to look out, and just enjoy, and just you know, re, be re-energized by the green space. So just this, just an note of that. I appreciate the cautionary tale. I was the person that said about the vegetables. So I think this is a wonderful learning opportunity for me. I am not an expert on green roofs and I say I defer uh, absolutely and appreciate um, you having uh, sharing that insight with, with the group. Um, I think, uh, is there anyone else that wants to share some thoughts around the green roof uh, uh, based on David McMillan bringing that up? I think great point. Um, I. I don't know, Haley Ray, do you want to maybe mention anything around accessibility when we talk about these green roofs? How, how can we make sure that they are, you know, considering the accessibility points? Yeah, thanks, Leslie. Um, I think uh, the, the extent of which I'll, I'll add is um, consideration for raised, <clears throat> excuse me, raised planter beds, as an example. Um, uh, and just varied height of, of the of the plantings, um, specifically from the perspective of folks using mobility devices, um, thinking about opportunities to engage with those plantings um, using a front approach, which would require um, suitable sort of knee clearance and toe clearance, um, or if depending on what the scenario is, it might be appropriate to have like a side approach to engage with that plant material. Um, but in an ideal setting, yeah, those raised planter beds um, that provide that front approach um, specifically for folks using mobility devices is sort of top of mind there. Thanks, Haley Ray. It's great, great to get to keep those things in mind. I, I I'm, I'm going to throw another idea at that, and and Christine, you might tell me I'm totally wrong. I'm I'm shouldn't be throwing ideas out. I'm the facilitator, but at the risk of being uh, out of school here, um, what about an ice rink? Is that possible to do on a roof? Um. It is possible. We have done ice rinks before. Um, ice rinks aren't very green, unfortunately. There are CO2 rinks, and uh, down over at College Park, um, we installed um, that CO2 rink there, so it is using CO2 as opposed to glycol and other chemicals within there as a refrigerant. But um, there is exhaust that come off of the mechanical equipment for that. So. If anyone ever goes to College Park and they see that skating rink, and um, unfortunately the park has been destroyed by people over COVID um, who were desperate to look for places and turned the entire park into a dog park. Um, so killed all the grass, killed a bunch of the materials in there. But there is a skating rink that lives to run inside of College Park. If you go there and you're in the on the rink and there's the pool, there's, there's not the pool house, but the field house there, which is the change room and everything else for people who are using it. And you look straight across the park and over to your right, you're going to see a bunch of stacks. Those stacks are exhaust. 
and it's exhaust for the equipment required for it. Mm -hmm. So not exactly super friendly um, with respect to the mechanical equipment required for the refrigeration process of an outdoor skating rink. Mm -hmm. um, that's our that's our problem. So the continuous refrigeration of that skating surface, it does require us to use mechanical means that not aren't necessarily super green. Now the argument is that the CO2 system that they are using within those pipes is far more sustainable, far more green than the than the old system, say the, the system that's being used down at Mason Phillips Square. That's a different system. Um, that is the older system of using um of, of, of having um, refrigeration, an uh, older refrigeration system that is even less friendly than, than the CO2 system. But if you're looking at overall um, compatible systems, the, the, the CO2 system is supposedly the most green. And I use that with severe quotation marks around green. Okay. So new innovation for those. <laughs> Thanks. I don't mean to open up a can of worms, but I appreciate those insights. Uh, Christine, are there any other innovative ideas or thoughts we want to maybe uh, put forward to those um, green spaces, whether it's on the roof or, as Bettina mentions, on uh, at every floor level uh, and around uh, before we move on to our next area? Uh, and remembering that we are going to be talking about gathering spaces and indoor and outdoor specific to that. So this is really more about the I think the 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 use of the roof space and the and the balcony spaces if there are, if there are some. I'm going to let the Jack Birdie music play in my head before we move on. Dave, are you unmuting? Bettina, or sorry, uh, Leslie. Can you hear me? Yes, nice. yes, I can hear you. Yeah, so I guess um I mean going back to my commentary right at the beginning of the day. All of these things are cool ideas, but you know, you're handing down a boatload of potential challenges to building operators and you know, um, the future users uh, of the building. I'm, um, and I'm sure other people on, the, uh, on this call are familiar with our green roof uh, expert who, who uh, knows way more about it than I do, but you know, all of these these things can bring challenges, um, unforeseen challenges. I love the idea of, you know, um, different uses for the roof and other spaces uh, on the building, um, but, you know, just mindful of this kind of, um, uh, the simplicity that I think is uh, inherent in passive uh, solutions. And to Christine's point, you know, uh, uh, a skating rink brings all kinds of mechanical requirements that might be out of sync with that that other vision, at least the vision that I articulated um, earlier. Um, active green roofs for agriculture, I'm familiar with a few of them in the city, and um, they do require a lot of uh, maintenance. And it's not just the water issue that uh, Christine identified, but there, you know, you have to have employees or volunteers who look after those plants and uh that's a, it's a really cool thing but it you know again it's it's an active participation that that is required and uh, you certainly don't want these things to become uh, a burden um in the future but i you know i love the idea of of uh you know vegetables being grown on the roof that are used in the restaurant on the main floor kind of thing and that circularity uh, we haven't talked at all about circularity today but I think that's a really interesting concept as well. And so you can think about, you know, uh, how you might use things that are otherwise uh, thrown away or disposed of and how they might be used in a, in a circular context. And, and there's a simple example of, of growing food on the roof and using it um, uh, on, in, in the restaurant or making it available uh, uh, for users in the neighborhood. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Mike. I appreciate those perspectives for sure. It's good to keep in mind that the fundamental reasons that we are here is to achieve that that positive, that net positive um, building a project for STLC and, and to support their RFP process. Um, now, Kara, thanks for rejoining us. If there's anything you wanted to add regarding uh, the mechanical perspective, if we're looking at doing a green roof uh, for this project, is there anything that we should be um, thinking about? 
So, yeah, I've been listening and uh, wanting to chime in just in a bunch of places. So let me be quick. One of the biggest innovations in the most interesting sustainable buildings on the planet has to do with massing and use of adjacent spaces in um, really cohesive ways. So in uh, laboratories, for example, the most sustainable buildings cascade air from um, lobbies into offices and then into the laboratory and out. So you use the same number of CFM to do three different tasks, but it requires that the building be massed properly. Um, the Manitoba Hydro Building, uses stack effect to move air through the building but they had to actually group the floors in certain ways and have these atriums adjacent so one of the things i think should be in the rfp is how the massing will be assessed from a sustainability perspective what tools will be used to show how air will move through it um, and how people and, and 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 sort of other energy flows will work um, I, I've tried to find these slides before, I haven't been able to, but when they did the Manitoba Hydro Building, the site isn't um, north-south oriented, and they experimented with, in rapid energy analysis, 18 different massings for that site before landing on the one they did. So form following function, I think, is really important. Uh, you know, the City of Toronto's um, City Hall is iconic but it doesn't harvest energy very well and we would like for this building to be both iconic and harvest energy very well uh, and then there's just been a bunch of really good things going on in the chat um, like a roller skating rink it's not going to use any energy unlike a skating rink so a skating rink is just a giant outdoor refrigerator um, and that's because it has to remove all of the solar energy even when it's you know minus five out uh, you have to actively cool that surface um, we we do have like i don't want to get hung up on technology for the green roof i guess is the other thing if we can blue sky it you know there's a lot of technologies available that will let us solve the the challenges water treatment is a thing we can purchase um you know off-site electricity that's green is a thing we can purchase for this building if we don't want to see um, mechanical systems on the roof uh, we live in a city that's hooked up to deep lake water cooling we don't have to have on-site energy generation and we can still use sustainable technologies to kind of achieve our goals i think those are all my thoughts thank you Thanks so much, Kara. Some some really important points to to consider, um, particularly in response to some ideas that I've thrown out that um, maybe weren't uh, in line with the vision for the building. So I appreciate that, um, Dave and uh, or Sava or, or Bettina. Does anyone else have anything additional to add before we move on to our next topic area? Uh, it's Devin here. Uh, I just wondered about talking about uh, education spaces as well. So, I mean, I think one of our uh, big objectives with moving uh, all buildings in the city towards net zero and high performance is highlighting some of that. So, especially when you have a space like, uh, you know, the St. Lawrence Centre that's open to the public, I think it's a great opportunity to highlight some of the, um, you know, high performance design features of the building. And, you know, I think just putting in a little bit of consideration about how that could be integrated would be a great thing to think about. Thanks, Devin. I think that's a great idea that we can uh, perhaps take a moment to unpack together. Um, it's, a, it's an ad hoc discussion point, um, and I love it. I think that's the thing about being flexible and adaptive is that, and learning as we go, why not take a moment to talk about education spaces? And incidentally, I think it, it, it aligns well with some of the things that have already been mentioned as we've gone through the previous discussion to make um, the, the windows space to be an, a learning opportunity. So do we want to take a moment and, and hear thoughts on how we can, uh, or, or some ideas from your respective areas of expertise on what um, the STLC Next project might consider to support this incorporating education components or to showcase education. Bettina, why don't I throw to you to start with because you're you're because <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> uh, one thing that I 
really wish our buildings could teach is from an indoor environmental quality point of view is to remark upon the point that often people think about indoor air quality and they use it almost as a proxy and and it, it's easy it's measurable it's identifiable we think about the quality of the air and we think well that that's a healthy space but there's so much more to having healthy spaces that uh, make people feel like they give them a sense of well-being make them feel like they belong a, a sense of comfort and finding a way to identify even things such as the materials such as uh, the interaction between how the envelope and the mechanical systems and the people interacting with the building how all of those things together are what are maybe causing uh, the sense of how you feel in a building i, I know david and uh Liam as well, and a number of people are talking about this idea of interactivity with the building, and uh, yeah, having having interactive scavenger hunts. Brian's just saying, and I think ways of of having people become more aware of the space that they're in uh, actively. You know, in meditation, we we try to think about the space that we're in and we try to become more aware of things that we just simply weren't aware of some of the simplest things and so they're the obvious things i love evergreen brickworks and the way they have a, everything you know all the sustainable things that are uh and I, i've learned tons going through that system uh, but yeah ha having a more esoteric way of having people become more aware of the experience around them and how that makes them feel and how and and also interacting actively this space was designed to make you feel welcome do you feel welcome? <laughs> what is it that we can, because it's not like it's a static thing, we can continue to make people feel like they belong in this space. Thanks so much, Bettina. Those are brilliant points. And I, I want to read uh, Miles' uh, uh, comment in the chat box in case you didn't read it. The USD BC office in DC has a wall with samples of all the materials used in the office and information about it. So it's a great example of, of an educational component in the building in, in DC. So I think that when we have other ideas of, of educational um, way that we can make this, this building more educational, it might be great for us to, to brainstorm that a little bit. So thanks Bettina for starting us off. Um, I, I'm going to go around by my screen. So I apologize if I cut you off a little bit. Nicole, you're the next person on my screen. Would you mind sharing your thoughts on, on how we might make this building more educational? Uh, yeah, so I, I think that we, uh, we're we starting to come back to things that we have already talked about, in a sense. Um, we talked about the, the quote unquote truth windows um, and, and using those to educate people who might come to the building. Um, but I think that we can also maybe make um, it a little bit more formal to a degree um, in the sense of rather than having these passive, uh, we'll, you know, having these passive things that people can engage with, but also having um, formal programs and taking into account um, you know, how how might the formal programs be able to be designed and how that would um, what requirements that would bring from the from the building. So is it uh, live energy information at the building, right, rather than just gathering that information and sharing it um, through some means off site, through some means on the Internet? Is it something that um, captures and shares uh, how much water has been saved by uh, the, the mechanisms that have been put in place. Is it something that captures, you know, if you do the vegetable garden that captures what percentage of uh, the vegetables used in that restaurant are grown on site and, and having, you know, screens or something that is updated and really engages people with the space in that way. Yeah, wonderful point. And Kara adds, having air terminals and operable um, that can, occupants can interact with and get a clear feedback about how it impacts their sense of thermal comfort is something that, that she's super interested in. 
educating about how and when natural ventilation. I'm not going to read that. Oh, and then Haley Ray. I hope everyone's reading the chat. Um, I think that, yeah, these are some great opportunities to incorporate education throughout the building. So um, I know it also one of the points that Nicole made tied into something that Sebastian said earlier around, you know, having that that uh, lot the energy usage live so that people can see and interact and understand what's happening with it. I don't know, um, Sarah, if there's anything more you want to add, um, I'll turn it to you. Um, a few things. So we talked about interactivity of, of occupants or people within the building. That's that's one of the dimensions I think education plays a big role. Um, having the building learn from occupants and having the potential things like apps that provide a simple random are you comfortable yes no yes and based on that kind of adjust the building i think it's it's almost like education goes two ways and we want the building to learn we want the occupants to learn the other dimension or the other kind of layer is we have all the we, we have schools close to the building we have programs that specialize in mechanical design in hvac this would be a great location to have connections with those programs to invite students to come and learn see how the building's operated and understand a little bit more so again taking it to that neighborhood or kind of city specific i think would be another great uh, great point um again the idea of as occupants we're curious and we want to learn and it, and we have the tools and technology to do that live so uh, having that live feedback, I think, I think it's it's one way to learn by by just experiencing space. Wonderful, thanks. That's great op options, Aaron. And um, I feel like we've heard from most everyone, but I don't think we heard from Dave Peterson or Christine on this last point. And Haley, I think you, Haley Ray, sorry, I think you added points into the chat function. So if you wanted to um, also add in to uh, this roundtable on it. Uh, including an educational component to the building. I think that'd be great. Dave Peterson, over to you. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I think, again, we have um, buildings um, in, the, in the GTA that have this in place already. And when I'm thinking about this discussion, I think about the Ontario Science Centre and the interactivity that's connected there. Now, that's not specific to the building itself, although why not create something similar? Um, and so, you know, let, let's question things. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to focus just on fenestration right now, something that I would have loved to do in, in, in past buildings. And I think that might be a bit off the wall, but maybe fits this discussion is, you know, create a wall of shame. Have an area of fenestration and a ribbon strip glazing component that shows the worst case, like the existing window performance, looking at code steps beyond that, and then maybe some best practices in terms of best performing components. And have that interactive, have that set up either on the north facade in the winter months, you know, dare people to see how close they can get to that um, uh, strip window until they feel discomfort. Maybe even have a slider on the floor so that people can sort of interact from that perspective, see who you know, can get close enough without being or uncomfortable. Um, but then also then denoting the, the differences in energy performance, what that means to that building for that year in terms of, you know, improvements. And are these takeaways that people can then sort of wrap their heads around and take home with them to their residential um, homes, to their part nine dwellings? Are there areas that there they can apply what they've learned to not just enhance comfort and durability, but also reduce energy um, use in their own homes? So if we want to sort of create that interactive effect, it doesn't have to be in all areas. I think maybe one specific area, north or south, could be interesting in terms of the differences in terms of comfort. Um, and it really, I think, you know, can help showcase um, that these technologies, although, you know, they may look similar um, in terms of just their skin appearance, are quite different in terms of how they actually perform. Um, and, you know, energy performance is interesting for some people, maybe a very small, and obviously in this group, I think a larger group loves the energy side of things. I'm one of those, but it's really how it makes us feel. And, and that interaction with, with how we sort of connect with that space and in terms of the comfort, our ability to stay in an area, um, and enjoy that space for what it is, I think are important considerations. And somehow if we can create some interactivity surrounding those. And, and occasionally we wanna make people feel uncomfortable so that they really understand what they're getting in terms of where these technologies are taking us. And I think that that sort of you know, creates a level playing field. 
Thanks so much, Dave. I think these are all great points, and probably what, with the report for the City of Toronto for Geo Live, we'll, we'll have a you know a, a consider education, and then we'll have some sub bullets of things that they might consider as part of the RFP process. So it's not prescriptive; it's just open ended. And I think there are maybe a couple more comments to hear from the group before we move on to our next area. Um, I, I, I don't think we've heard from Haley Ray. I know you might have had something in the chat component. Did you want to add on? camera on, on mic, uh, a little something to this? Yeah, thanks, Leslie. Um, in thinking about education spaces, um, I'd just like to bring forward the idea of neurodiversity and consideration for folks with any sort of mental health related learning, developmental um, disability types and those sort of invisible disability types and how um, those are supported in the built environment. Um, one tactic to consider is the aspects index. Um, which includes uh, considerations for acoustics and spatial sequencing and escape space, um, compartmentalization, um, transitions, uh, sensory zoning, and safety. Um, also, the idea of um, be it in person spaces, hybrid, virtual, and just how all of those um, sort of are, are grouped together to provide um, an enriching educational experience for those um, involved. Um, our, our approach to both uh, focus spaces and collaboration spaces within those educational um, environments and just the features of those are um, are different. And then again, pulling on the idea of um, of escape spaces, thinking about um, what's commonly called like quiet rooms or multi-sensory rooms and the various sort of um, design features that um, are, are sort of recommended to ensure that those are done appropriately. Thanks so much, Haley Ray. Great points. Um, sometimes you see me, I'm taking notes as I go, just to make sure I'm emphasizing things in the final report. For the uh, Kara, did you have something you wanted to add uh, with in regards to this discussion point? Yeah, this isn't mechanical, but just thinking about what arts communities are linked in to this whole conversation in the city of Toronto right now. Um, I'm a member of a community that does a lot of their practicing in parks, as an example. So who is able to access and knows how to institutionally access these kinds of facilities? And is there a way that we can survey their needs before uh, finalizing exactly which communities are going to be served by the space? That's a great point, Kara. I really appreciate it. I think there is going to be um, a discussion area on the actual um, engagement side of things. So I will make sure that we incorporate that into that section and also hear from you again then. Um, is there anything else before we move on? Leslie, did you want to add something? Oh, I just wanted to add one little point to Haley Ray's um, comment about the neurodiverse community. Um, I think we're talking a lot about visitors and I'm always thinking about the day-to-day -day inhabitants and so I think that directly connects to um, having neurodiverse workers and staff members and people that are actually working in the building and and so those needs are kind of being thought about from a slightly different perspective but along the lines and um, I think that's wonderful thank you thanks Leslie that's great um, so many I wonderful thought, things. Sorry, was there a point to be made? Oh, it was just Christine. Oh, sorry, Christine. Sorry, I mean, just I just wanted to, just before we left this this point about education, was that uh, I was thinking anecdotally of a, of a park that we did several years ago, that which is a sensory park. And the intention of that was to engage all seven senses of an individual who was a visitor to that park and be um, more inclusive with respect to having spaces for all users and people of all abilities when we when we did this space. But when we talk about seven, people always look at the five senses and not think about the, the other two that are part of the seven senses. We only ever lost top five in our, when we were kids, but there's actually seven, seven you know, the conventional um, sight, smell, taste, hearing, touch are the conventional five senses. But there's also vestibular and um, perception, which are the other two senses that, that we need to engage in. But when we were doing that park, one of the things that we tried to do, because we were trying to engage people of all abilities, um, we tried to integrate into design things that um, people who were who had low vision or less vision or blind 
they could engage into that. And, and so as we designed these spaces, um, we were very conscious to include things that engage them through smell and through taste and through hearing and through touch. And equally, when we were dealing with other hearing impaired individuals, we, we integrated other aspects that, that incorporated those other senses that they, they, they couldn't fully engage in. So the whole idea was that all of everybody who was in the space were engaged on all those levels. When you take it and you, you translate that then possibly to this, this part, in that part, this, this this project, you think of it, how can we then engage and and educate people um, through other ways means. And, and the chat was really interesting because they were talking about QR codes. Um, and but we've done other ones where we had also QR codes there, but we've also had um, signage there that was explanatory and, and not so wordy that. You had to have a university education to read on it, um, but also, you know, incorporated Braille, incorporated large lettering for people who had low vision, not just no vision. Um, and because there's a lot of people that actually can read Braille who are blind is, is very small as, as compared to the amount of people who have low vision and just can't see tiny little microscopic lettering. So we try to incorporate all of that. So I think that as we move towards this project, you think that how can we, as, as an educational tool, engage the people on those various senses so that it addresses not just the people who are visiting, um, but to Leslie's point, the people there who are there every day, the people there who are working in those spaces, and even the performers who come there. So how can we engage them and educate them as to the functioning of, 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 of everything there in the building, not just the exterior, not just the, the functions of the windows and other, other sustainable measures, but it's about it, are there other ways in which we can engage them other than the conventional kind of reading this or even, even um, you know, tapping on a QR code? Are there ways that we can engage them and educate them on how we're approaching this building and how we're approaching the new sustainable measures that address the different senses? So those are just my thoughts. Thank you so much, Christine. I think there's so much to unpack here. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, I'm taking notes as we go, and I think that I just want to make sure that we've heard from everyone. I do believe we have. I know Mike hasn't chimed in on this particular point in terms of education building, but it, uh, it's not, I mean, if Mike Singleton, if you wanted to add anything, you're welcome to, of course. And if anyone from the City of Toronto had more to add, um, we're just kind of rounding up our thoughts on making the building, uh, have, like integrating educational components within the, the building space in a way that speaks to, you know, I think all seven senses of what we heard, um, you know, incorporating quiet spaces and uh, making sure that we're speaking to, um, you know, real-time learning opportunities and neurodivergent needs and uh, real-time energy performance. I know Miles had a, a comment on that in the chat function that we've taken a note of. So Mike, I'm just throwing it to you for maybe a last word on uh, educational spaces or, or integrating educational components within the space. Yeah, I, I think these are all great um, ideas and commentary. So I didn't really have um, uh, anything to add uh, uh, in, terms of, in terms of that list. You know, what, what we're doing here is, a, is an educational activity and and uh, such that these kinds of activities can be embraced in that space, um, that would be awesome as well, but I don't have any kind of specific ideas. Thanks so much, Mike and Leslie. Did you want to um, Just in case people weren't looking at the chat, I think Sebastian made the point that I would say encompasses everything. We're telling a story, and this primarily is what culture does right we're all telling a story and we're sharing stories so i love this idea that everything that people are discussing right now is adding to the narrative so it's all contributing and i really appreciate all these ideas because ultimately that's what i think we're trying to do and we're trying to um tell the story so when we get into the design competition that it becomes realized in in some of these ways that um, we want to see creatively addressed. 
Thank you, Leslie. Yes, I mean, it really is all about sort of helping to inform um, what the TO Live team will put out for that design competition and incorpor incorporating these, these thoughts in a way that's useful for that purpose. So I really appreciate the more ideas we have, the better. And then we can always have them as, for example, and let lots of different examples for just to give a flavor um, for a, a, a design team to consider how they might do something helps to prime the pump and get ideas flowing for themselves too. Um, so we know that this is not a prescriptive process. We're not coming up with the design ourselves, but we're giving lots of great ideas to support that. Um, I think that we're ready to move on from this area. And I just wanted to thank everyone for the great discussion. I love that we also incorporated two ad hoc discussion points uh, as a result of the feedback that we've gotten through this session. So this we spent a little longer um, on the innovative spaces than I imagined we would have. I thought we were just going to do a roundtable uh, to kind of encapsulate what we said in the creative spaces. Uh, and I think it's it's fantastic that we've taken the time to dive deeper um, into different elements within that innovative space, including the green roof and incorporating education within that space. So I think, again, we're going to find there will be overlap. It is a bit of a Venn diagram. And in fact, um, let me stop sharing for a second and move us back into our uh, picture of the Venn diagram or the, the interactive mm -hmm. space um, design components that we talked about earlier, just to refresh our memories on it. Uh, I'm going to reshare my screen now. Thank you for your patience with my technology moments. Um, so just to kind of take a step back and uh, remind ourselves kind of where we are and the bubbles of or the Venn diagram of all these, the way these things fit together. So within the, the STLC hub or corridor or um, this new neighborhood experience. We're ta we've talked about creative spaces and ways that we can incorporate these you know, work studios and creative development within that space. We talked about innovative spaces and, and incorporating flexibility and technology. We're moving now into these gathering spaces. We're gonna look at indoor and outdoor spaces. Then we're gonna look at um, the outdoor areas and, and the kind of a larger uh, world view of diversity, sustainability, future proofing and climate sustainability. So that's where we're going in this discussion at this point. So I thought it um, might be a good time to just refresh where, you know, how these things all kind of interact and interconnect and fit together. Um, I don't want to give you any busy spells. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second again as I move back to the slide that we're actually at. <laughs> Okay, so we're into the gathering space as we talked about, or as I shared with you in that uh, Venn diagram world, I don't know what you would call that diagram, but it's got a bit of a Venn thing in the center of it with the hub. Um, so a bubble diagram. Okay, we're going with bubble diagram. So um, when we move into the gathering spaces, we've had a lot of great ideas around sort of those, uh, you know, making the space welcoming and inviting and, and, and um, accessible and um, speaking to on many levels to different people. And so here we have um, expanding the narrative to really look at the outdoor space. So we're going to talk about the outdoor space and then we're going to talk about the indoor space. And then we're going to talk about blurring the lines and how do we connect the inside with the outside. So we'll start with that outdoor public space piece. And at a high level, you know, what do you think are some ways that we can inclusively and safely invite the public into the design uh, of this building to encourage gathering outside of the, the building itself. And again, I think that we, we have talked about um, this, could, this footprint could sort of incorporate the, the, um, the park across the street with the, uh, I can't remember the name, but with the dog, so thank you, with the, with the, uh, the, the, the brilliant dog fountain and um, by the, the Flatiron building. So there's an opportunity to have that area be included into your vision here. So I'm going to perhaps turn the first person to answer this question. I'm going to turn it over to, um, I get to choose? Oh, so much fun choosing. I'm going to suggest, why don't we start with Kara on this one? 
Because it's not really a mechanical question, Kara. No, inclusive, safe, and inviting public space design considerations outdoors. So I think having a variety of different gathering size spaces, ensuring that acoustic um, protection is available downtown. Um, it can be very difficult to use outdoor spaces um, if they're too loud. Um, let me see what else. Uh, and having uh, ability to shelter from the weather, possibly the weather today is really making me think about that. Um, but shade structures and overhangs and ways to keep spaces dry is critical if we're going to make the best use of our outdoor spaces. Great, great suggestion. So really practical, right? So making sure there's shading and there's um, trees and there's there's uh, weather protection. Okay, so moving on. Um, so what might Nicole think about? when she thinks about outdoor design considerations that are, you know, really inclusive, welcoming, and there's that that feeling of shared ownership, like this space belongs to everyone. And so the first thing I thought of when um, you started talking about this was outdoor space for um, performers who are not necessarily associated with the facility, like buskers and street performers and um, having areas for for people to you know like sit and watch and enjoy uh those performers i mean the first thing that i thought of was you know like concrete benches obviously we don't want to go with concrete because of the the carbon aspect but um something you know durable and uh obvious that it's there for people to to sit on and um so that people feel welcome in and sitting down and watching whoever might be, you know, performing there that day and, and have it be a, a very informal kind of thing where hopefully performers wouldn't have to, to register necessarily. Maybe, maybe there's some kind of overall, you know, pre-approval, but once they have that, they can kind of come by and perform whenever they, uh, whenever they want. Thanks, yeah, that, that was kind of the, my main thought when you brought that up. Yeah, no, I think those are great points. And um, I'll take a note of the pre-approval. I think that's more of a policy for the building rather than um, what we can do with the space. But it's, it's, it is worth taking note of. And I think that the you know having durable benches or places for seating, they're all in, in, in enabling that ongoing performance um, access. It's really a great point. Um, so moving around the group, why don't we see what uh, Christine has to say about the outdoor gathering space that is, you know, welcoming and inclusive for all. So this is my stuff, right? This is this is landscape architecture. This is what we what we consider and what would be fall within our daily bed. Um, <clears throat> but when I when we're looking to create these. Um, outdoor gathering spaces. Um, we look at a number of factors, and, and you, you you hit on a number of them in your little talking point. I'm talking about. Um, I apologize, the phone's ringing in the background. You have to okay, let, it, let it do its thing. Um, but safety and, and and culturally inclusive and welcoming and belonging and shared ownership and decolonization. Um, but what we're looking to do is create a variety of spaces. We're looking to create safe spaces and so taking into consideration the principles of SEPTED and those who don't know what SEPTED means, it's, it's an acronym for crime prevention through environmental design and, and SEPTED has a number of aspects and a number of considerations that we need to take in, in developing these outdoor spaces. Um, so well-lit spaces, spaces that don't, ha don't have any um, don't have any dark hiding spots on them, they don't, don't have spaces where people feel unsafe because it's so far tucked back, it's so in the corner, it's so well secured that people just don't feel safe in their faces. So that we're trying to balance these the idea of these protected, quiet, you know, refuge spaces, but still making them safe. And we make them safe through visibility, we make them safe through them being well lit, so dark sky compliant, well lit, so it conforms to the city standards with respect to to eliminating and reducing light pollution. Um, 
but we, we try to incorporate all of those into window spaces. Um, seating, very important, but have a variety of seating. Seating at various types of heights and seating at various with, with different types of in, how you engage them, whether or not they're long benches, whether or not they're four seats, seats with arms, all of those would allow people of various abilities to use that type of, of seat. Seats that somebody with a wheelchair can come into and, and, and if they're more able could slide across onto, um, and, and, and not need to just stay in their own wheelchair. All of, and, but people who are older, armrests that, that allow them to lever themselves up. People who want to sit there with their friends and put their feet up on the set seat and engage on the seat in a different way that you or I may not sit there, but young people like to bring their feet up and sit up on the seat or sit on the back of the seat. And so what we create and provide has all those different opportunities. Um, Kara mentioned shade um, and to keep dry. That's important. But within our, our environment and the use of the spaces um, in the summer, um, more often than not, it's, it's what we're providing and what we're really considering as being important is not a full shade within the space, but more of a dappled shade. A dappled shade meaning a shade that may be provided by a, a, um, a structure that has a, um, a trellis over top that allows wear, wind um, airflow. Really important outside, as we all know, when sitting outside is to get that breeze. And we can't get that breeze if we're sitting in an enclosed space on the outside. Um, that may work in other environments, but in Toronto in the summer, no one wants to sit inside a greenhouse. You know? So what we would like to do is have, have a space that provides us with some shelter, some privacy, some green, but actually allows the air to flow in there and cool us down as we're engaging in those spaces. Um, and, and all of that is, is tied up with creating a space that's functional and beautiful and attractive. And, and um, when we're there, re-energizes us, makes us look like, wow, we take a deep breath and we go, oh, I'm in a space that kind of provides me with that sense of um, uh, just a rejuvenation. That's why the little park, the Grizzia Park across the street is so well used. It's that respite area. It gives that people that breathing space that allows them to engage with nature a little bit, as opposed to being everywhere else in the city where it's concrete upon concrete upon concrete. So the use of materiality is really important. Creating, and as I mentioned, see, you know, the materiality of those seats become important. What's comfortable to sit on? What What is something that's also um, doesn't contribute to embedded carbon? So it's not concrete benches there. So like wood benches, but wood benches that are, that are sustainable, wood benches that, that aren't going to fall apart in two or three years because they're made with materials that, that don't have the longevity or lifespan on there. So it's all of that that we're looking for is creating these outdoor gathering spaces, but but looking to create spaces that people will use and will become well used and will become well loved. And one of the things we keep saying to people is is if we create a space and we do it well, they almost become their own policing um, of the the people that use it, um, take on those spaces and, and and take more care of those spaces. You see these derelict parks that just seem to continue to, to deteriorate. It's because no one kind of feels ownership of those spaces. No one feels love. They feel the, feel the love of the spaces to be really hokey about it, but they don't take those spaces on. And, and if you enjoy the space and you, and you really, really care for the space, then you do take care of the space and it makes it more welcoming. It makes it more, more inclusive to the people that, that use it. So all of those are aspects that we think about. I know there's a proximity to Bursey Park and there's a lot of chatter that was going on earlier about, about connections to Bursey Park, about Scott Street. Um, Scott Street has been designed in a specific way with respect to streetscape with no curbs and with the ability for people to spill across Scott Street. But Scott Street will never be closed because there's a parking garage that is right on Scott Street. They can only get in or out of Scott Street. So Scott Street will never be closed. But Scott Street access to Scott. Scott Street could be reduced. The construction of Scott Street was, was done in that way. So there may be possibilities that we may be able to capture that some of that flavor of Scott Street on our little patch of, of front. Mm-hmm. And that there may be a more of a disappearing of the edges of the street. And that's a possibility. Um, we are doing another section of street in Toronto with a similar idea where the edges kind of disappear and the, the edges of the street blur with the 
sidewalk edges and the patio edges, similar to what's happening down over, um, down by um, St. Lawrence Market on Market Street, um, parts of the Esplanade. And then this will be Colburn, the next street that's going to have this blurring of the edges um, where it's not just traffic for cars, but it's also places for people to engage upon that street. So I think there's an opportunity of the edges of those spaces around the building can kind of blur across um, front, understanding that there's a lot of traffic on front, but then move you across and then have that connection over to Bercy. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, will, I will stop because I can go on all day. And, and I'll let other people have a, have a chance to have a discussion on this. Thanks so much, Christine. There is a lot that you shared there. I'm really glad that we're recording this because I'm going to want to listen again to make sure I capture all your points. There's lots there. And I also note that Kara had a comment in the chat, um, as did uh, Sarah have a couple comments. So the Kara's is around really making sure there's paths for different places and that there's no squeeze points or a path leading to nowhere. Um, and that, that it also speaks to the technology so that we let people in and out of the venue very easily. So it's a, a safe and easy ingress and egress. Sarah pointing about bike ride, racks, my favorite thing as a cyclist in Toronto, oftentimes can't find where can I park my bike. So thank you for that. Bike racks, benches, picnic tables, good lighting. That was another point that, that Christine touched on and, and Kara touched on is like make sure that it's safe. Um, uh, and so signage with info about the building, uh, a key piece of art or mural created by a local indigenous artist and uh, mention about a, a few other things uh, here. So please be, make sure you're, you're eyeing the chat functions because there are always great points made in these uh, uh, comments. Appreciate those. We are going to be breaking for lunch in about five minutes, but I, I would love to hear from, or we could delay our lunch break so that we can conclude this discussion. Why don't we, are we okay to do that? We'll go a few minutes over of our lunch break and, and wrap this one up. Um, I don't think we've heard from everyone yet. So I want to make sure that everyone has, that who wants to add to this discussion has an opportunity to talk about their ideas or some thoughts that, that we could consider for enhancing and encouraging gathering outdoors of this space. Oh, go ahead, Seba. <laughs> this is, these are the fun questions for me because they're the ones that take me away from my day-to-day -day in the energy modeling outdoors are not something we consider, but um, my thoughts are around the process rather than the design itself, um, engagement and continuing to engage the communities and making sure that it's a diverse community and that it's a neighborhood that, that's really engaged. Throughout the entire design process, I think it's really important um, there's an exercise that has been done in, in a lot of the larger kind of hospitals, which is called a day in the life, where basically you ask, uh, you, you make the design team put themselves in the shoes of a specific kind of persona and have them walk the building through those lenses and try to understand how they see the building as they interact through it with, with their, their, their own perception. So I think that's, that, that might be an interesting um, element when we're thinking about, about kind of requirements for an RFP. Um, designing for four seasons and designing, making sure the programming fits four seasons and, and that it's catered to the, the great fact that we have four seasons here. Um, so, so keeping that in mind um, and just pointing, I know there's been a lot of conversation around local art, just pointing at, at an example, two blocks from my house, under, Underpass Park is a great example of bringing local um, artists to put um, art into the park and into the landscape and building and really building that sense of ownership at the neighborhood level. So, so really engaging the local artists and, and letting them have an opportunity to imprint themselves into the building and into the outdoors, I think would be, would be really important. I love that, um, Sebastian. It's a lot about the co-creation, right? To, that the lived experience and experience of everyone is involved in, in giving a voice to considerations in the final product. Um, fantastic points. Um, moving and the designing for four seasons, all great points. Um, we're taking notes of everything. David, do you have a, any thoughts? And, and um, just want to make sure we've heard from everyone. Haley Ray, I think we yeah. might be one of you from you too. Go ahead, Pat, Dave. Thanks, Leslie. So sure. I think oh, there's been a lot of really Peterson. Got it. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're both next to each other, Dave. I'm sorry. So I'll just a short point. Let, let me maybe cre create a, a counterpoint. These there's been a lot of really 
a good positive um, components in this discussion. I think we have to be mindful of a couple of things. And, and if we're bringing this landscape design and we're connecting to, to the dog park across the street, we're obviously looking at sort of this interaction with the fauna in, in the area, both domesticated as well as wild. And I think we have to be sort of mindful of that as well, that we might want to bring those components in to create a more naturalized space. We talked about pollinators. We talked about birds. We have to be mindful of the fact that we have to create safety for those components if we are, in fact, connecting them to the, to the outdoor space. Things like feather friendly glazing design or building designs. Um, the, the inverse of that is I think we have to make a pact with or deal with the pigeons. And this is from a Seinfeld episode, I'm dating myself, but we got to figure this out because if we want them, we want them, we don't want defecation all over our key components. And then we have to deal with those things. So there's little things like that that are highly positive. If you look at them in one light, they're extremely negative if, if you're so inclined to look at the downsides of these interactions. Uh, pollinators are awesome. We can, you know, do lots of na natural plants. If you're allergic to bees, you might be really concerned about being in that space if, in fact, um, it's filled with bees. So, um, you know, I think that there's positive and negative consequences there. We just have to be mindful that is, with the positive ones come some, some other considerations. Um, and uh, anyway, there we go. So many great points. Uh, I, I I couldn't help but crack up when you mentioned the the pigeon uh, pact. <laughs> um, there and and Kara, some great points in your comments as well. That I'm not going to read them, but please, if, I invite everyone to take a, a look at the chat function. Now I know uh, we're going to listen to, to uh, reach out to Haley Ray in a second, but David McMillan, I think you were about to say something. If we can bring you in at this point and hear from the Daves together. Thanks. I'll be really brief. Uh, we've got to do something about Front Street uh, directly in front of the building here. It's very odd, right? And I understand, you know, the church in front and Wellington intersection is a problem. But, you know, going from a two way to a one way back to a two way, you know, you create this condition right in front where it's a bit of a car sewer. And that's not good for acoustics, especially if you want to open up the outside to performances or what have you, but also like the public realm is really lacking. The sidewalks are super narrow on that stretch of front. And like, it's just not a pleasant public realm. And I understand this is a bit beyond the scope of the building itself, but I think it's important given the use of this uh, space. And so I don't, I'm not convinced we're gonna be able to turn it back into a two way, uh, but you know, cycling infrastructure and wider sidewalks can really help buffer against that, make it sort of traffic light, slow down cars kind of like the treatment on Scott Street and maybe what the southern part might have is not to close it off if not possible, but I mean to really make it more pleasant for those not in cars. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, there, I love those points. It's great. It's just a calming zone. I think that was also a, a note that Sarah made too. So um, thank you very much for chiming in. I appreciate that. And uh, Haley Ray, do you have some additional thoughts on the outdoor space that you'd like to share? I do. Thank you. Um, just to frame thought process here. So I, in thinking about gathering space, um, I was reminded of some ideas um, that have come up a lot in the last two to three years related to our sort of working from home spaces, hybrid working in person, and just the fact that we rely quite heavily on our workplaces to fill our social buckets. Um, but long story short, emphasizing that we need more gathering spaces that allow us to build community and to continuously engage in that connectivity, both outside and inside. Um, the idea that um, to consider how the STLC invites people to visit again and again. Um, uh, and that also reminds me of just the idea of the um, visitor experience. I think oftentimes when we think about the built environment, we're very focused on um, that moment of visiting, that moment of being present in the built environment. Sometimes there's consideration for how we arrive and how we depart from that space. Um, but the full cycle of thinking about wishing and planning and traveling, arriving, visiting, departing, and remembering all related to that specific place um, uh, to, again, invite us to come back again and again. Um, and just before I forget the thought, I wanted to just echo, I think, what Seba shared about um, public consultation. And um, oftentimes, uh, you know, there there is the understanding that we need the presence of, of persons with disabilities um, as a part of that consultation, um, but also considering um, what other perspectives might not be typically included. I think there's a common demographic demographic of folks who commonly contribute to public consultation. So just understanding all of the ways that we can engage um, folks, uh, uh, I'd say, 
particularly outside of the nine to five um, and making sure that there's folks of all ages contributing to that process of consultation. Um, and then in addition to that, I wanted to just echo, um, I think Christine noted some ideas related to um, safety in, in the exterior built environment. So um, from an accessibility perspective, avoiding uh, defensive or sort of hostile architecture, ensuring that it's welcoming. Um, I'll echo again, avoiding hangout steps and avoiding ramps in that exterior built environment. Um, thinking about providing rest areas that also have accessible seating. Um, in general, just considering accessible outdoor FF&E. Um, echoing, I think, a point that Kara shared about shade structures and providing that, um, uh, ensuring that that is provided also over maybe rest areas where folks might be um, spending some time. Um, at those rest areas, we may um, consider uh, uh, access to electric, electrical supply um, to provide charging opportunities for folks using powered mobility devices who are um, hanging out in the space for um, longer durations. Um, providing service animal relief areas um, uh, so that folks can you know, have those designated areas for their animals to relieve themselves that maintains the other sort of grass areas that are um, in the area if, if those are provided. Um, uh, the idea of maintenance of any of these accessible elements, um, first things that come to mind are lighting and waste receptacles. Um, uh, um, and in addition, uh, in thinking about, I think this most closely to me relates to like if any art is within that place, but if, if art installations are in, in those exterior environments, ensuring that um, you know, there's great color contrast to the surrounding built environment, that they're cane detectable, that there's ample headroom clearance, um, and that any of those sort of um, experiences are equitable across the board. Wow, wonderful. Thank you so much, Haley Ray. I think, uh, yeah, it's always amazing all of the different perspectives we get and then to add in like really an important accessibility consideration on like how does this how does this look and feel when we're talking about murals or art installations how do we navigate those in a way that is, uh, is safe and that we've got the supply considerations for those who maybe aren't walking in um and that might need to charge and might need to have their dogs uh have a rest area there's, there's so many things to consider i think this is a great place for us to um to break for lunch. Um, so we do have a half hour schedule for our break here. I've gone a little bit over. So we're at uh, 